Welcome everyone to tonight's meeting of the Port Phillip City Council being held via the WebEx platform and streamed via Council's webcast page and Facebook Live and I hope you are all well and safe. The City of Port Phillip respectfully acknowledges the traditional owners of the lands we meet from today. We pay our respects to their elders, both past and present. We acknowledge and uphold their continuing relationship to this land. So due to the current COVID-19 restrictions, tonight's meeting is being held virtually via the WebEx platform. And of course, while we have planned for this online meeting, there always remains the risk of technical issues arising that are beyond our control. And if we do experience any technical difficulties, we will adjourn the meeting for a short time to resolve them. And if we can't, we will uh, not continue the meeting and let people know as soon as possible when the meeting will resume. All submissions from members of the public will be heard at the start of the meeting. Additionally, voting on all motions will be under division, where the chair will call upon councillors individually in rotating alphabetical order to state their vote. So I will remind all attendees that anyone participating in tonight's meeting must extend due courtesy and respect to council and their processes under which it operates and must take direction from the chair whenever called on to do so. Speakers must resp remain respectful and statements or questions must not be defamatory, offensive or objectionable aimed at embarrassing a councillor or a member of council staff or relate to a matter outside the powers of the council. Uh, and just before we get underway with item, agenda item number one, apologies, I just wanted to say to the community, thank you so much for turning out in droves last week, the last two weeks to get tested and vaccinated. It's really heartening to see and um, I encourage you to continue to get vaccinated, but it, it made me really proud to be on council at a time when our community stepped up. So firstly, councillors, apologies. Do we have any apologies? I don't believe so. So we'll move on to item number two, which is minutes of previous meetings. Councillors, the minutes of the ordinary meeting held on the 18th of August 2021 have been circulated. Are there any questions regarding these minutes? If not, can I have a motion to confirm these? Can I have a mover and seconder? Mover, Councillor Martin, and do I have a seconder? Councillor Baxter. I'll now put that motion under division and call upon each councillor for your vote. Councillor Baxter. Four. Councillor Bond. Four. Councillor Clark. Four. Councillor Copsey. Four. Councillor Crawford. Four. Councillor Consolo. Four. Councillor Martin. Four. Councillor Pearl. In favour. And Councillor Sirikoff. Four. The motion is carried. Declarations of conflicts of interest. Does anyone have a conflict of interest in a matter being discussed at tonight's meeting? Councillor Copsey. Thank you, Mayor. I couldn't get my chat to work, but yes. Um, so I wish to declare that I own property within the general area of 351 St Kilda Road and out of an abundance of caution to avoid a potential or perceived conflict in item 13.3, intention to sell 351 St Kilda Road, I will remove myself from the meeting at that time. Thank you. So we're going to move to item four, which is public question time and submissions. And we will now hear all public submissions and comments on report items from members of the public. All the requests to speak were required to be submitted by 4 p.m. this afternoon. Now we do have a, a very long list tonight, so I will be really strict with the time, everyone. So all people about to speak, um, three minutes is your maximum. If you can um, be uh, efficient with your time, that would be wonderful. So we get to hear everyone with uh, alert uh, at this early part of the evening. So let's go with Tim Norman uh, submitting a question to council. Tim, are you there? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. If you could please state your name and suburb and then you've got three minutes. Thank you. Tim Norman from um, Port Melbourne. Uh, well, good evening, Mayor, Deputy Mayor, Councillors and Officers, and thank you very much for the opportunity to speak at Council this evening. Um, I spoke with Council on the 3rd of February uh, earlier this year when a petition was presented to Council regarding the risk of a significant event on Liardet Street, Port Melbourne, and a, a vehicle perhaps, or the risk of a vehicle colliding with a child, um, parent, family member, or user of the local parks. It's now been seven months uh, since that petition was presented to council and the risk to those users remains. Uh, I just wanted to ask council, or firstly thank council for the progress that's been made on this matter. 
and ask Council if they could please provide an update of the schedule of the works going forward, uh, confirmation of any funding arrangements that need to be made and any interim measures that are being put in place to reduce the risk of vehicle accidents uh, on Liardet Street. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. I believe we're going with Shay Sutherland to respond to your question. Thank you. Uh, through you, Mayor. Uh, thank you for the question, uh, which asks which steps, what steps Council has taken to make uh, Lyaday Street crossing safer for children and families. Officers understand the concern um, expressed in the petition uh, and felt by the community. Uh, following the February 2021 council meeting where this petition was tabled, council officers undertook pedestrian counts and traffic surveys in March. These confirmed that the pedestrian volumes in this location satisfied the Department of Transport requirements for the installation of a zebra crossing. And so officers have now prepared a concept design and received approval from the Department of Transport to install the new crossing, including in principle support to relocate the bus stop at the location. Uh, four weeks of community consultation on the proposed crossing design is planned for October 2021, although we acknowledge that this may be impacted by COVID-19 restrictions, but we'll do our best to get that out there. Uh, and Council will complete detailed designs for the crossing and lighting upgrades this year and have made a submission to the Transport Accident Commission for a contribution towards construction next year. In the absence of any recorded crashes at this location, no interim traffic treatment measures have been proposed, uh, but officers have shared data from recent traffic surveys with Victoria Police and requested the Paran Highway Patrol Unit continues to undertake speed enforcement operations in the interim. Thank you. Uh, I call upon Jenny Roper uh, submitting a question to Council. Hi Jenny, are you there? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can. If, if you could please state your name and suburb and um, Jenny Roper in St Kilda. Um, regarding the live action plan that was posted on Mayor Louise Crawford's Facebook page in the Herald Sun dated 23rd of August, I think it is great that we support our local musicians and artists. I do have a couple of questions. Firstly, if a booked gig slash performance is pre-booked before 23rd of August, 2021 and is cancelled inclusive 23rd August to 31 December and funding is approved by City of Port Phillip, does the artist have an obligation like an IOU to the City of Port Phillip for a future performance at a later date or is the City of Port Phillip giving the artist um, money with no performance at all like, like a Centrelink permit, like some help? With regards, that's one, with regards to venues claiming up to $5,000, is that the total amount the venues can claim or can they claim each week from the period of 23 August to 31 December? Will the venues at a future date give City of Port Phillip their venue at a reduced amount, amount if they have claimed the $5,000? Um, maybe these venues can be used for artists to play at for future St Kilda festivals in a smaller capacity. Um, the state government is also giving money to venues based on their liquor licence capacity. So does that mean, so does this mean that the City of Port Phillip are doubling up providing rental assistance that is currently being subsidised by the state government as well? Um, what is the total amount of monies that City of Port Phillip are actually providing for this period? And what I read in the live music action plan is about bringing more artists to the city of Port Phillip, not subsidising the rents. So how is this rental assistance for band rooms and promoters, the city of Port Phillip council responsibility when ratepayers are receiving an increase in rates? I appreciate your time. Thank you and stay safe. Thank you. I believe Carly Bennett will respond. Through you, Mayor. Uh, firstly, thank you, Jenny, for your questions. Council adopted a live music action plan in May 2021 with the primary objective that Port Phillip uh, be a centre for live music. That plan outlines ways Council will support, protect and future-proof live music locally. With respect to the Please Don't Stop the Music scheme, if a gig is cancelled and the artist involved is approved for payment under the scheme, they do not have any future obligations to the City of Port Phillip. 
the intent of the scheme is to provide some form of compensation for losses being incurred by this sector as a result of the lockdown, given the importance of the live music industry to the city of Port Phillip. In the short term, this may ensure that cultural activity does not occur at a time of public health restrictions. And in the longer term, it provides some support to sustain an industry through this period and attract artists, promoters and venues to the city of Port Phillip in the longer term. Venues can claim compensation for costs involved in cancelling or postponing a gig to a maximum of $5,000 per week. This is tied to gigs that were confirmed prior to the onset of lockdown uh, and it's highly unlikely most venues will seek to claim that full amount uh, is the view of officers. Further details on the program can be found at the Live and Local website, but in summary, Council will consider claims relating to recovering costs associated with booking and rescheduling performances, including contracted supplier fees such as crew, house, sound engineers and technicians, artists uh, and booking fees, rescheduling costs, which may include recovering sunk administrative, promotional and ticketing costs from the cancelled performance. Uh, in terms of the budget allocation, uh, on the 2nd of December 2020, uh, Council through uh, its first quarter financial update approve the reprioritisation of a portion of the $1.7 million budget that had been allocated to the 2021 St Kilda Festival. Uh, and through that process, uh, an amount of $200,000 was allocated to COVID safe community and live music event support. Uh, with respect to the initiative Locals Playing Locals and uh, the uh, initiative I've, I've just talked about in terms of please uh, don't stop the music, uh, as well as the artist database initiatives. Uh, they've been created uh, with the intent to complement rather than replicate measures from other tiers of government. And officers will continue to support council to advocate to other levels of government on the importance of this sector to our city, our traders and high streets. Thank you. I now call upon Alan Renshaw submitting a question to Council. Alan, are you there? Yes, I am. Uh, why, when it, Alan, you're very you? faint. Are you close to your Sorry. phone? Could you speak up a little bit? Can you hear me now? Just, but maybe it's me. Uh, if you could state your name and suburb and then please take your three minutes. Um, Alan Renshaw from Little Park. Madam Chairman, a media release by the City of Port Phillip 23rd of August states council is offering up to 5,000 per week. Alan, sorry to interrupt you. We just can't hear you. You're really, really faint. And my sound is right can, Is there any way I can bring this up louder? That's a little better. Is that better? That's better if you could start again. Sorry, Alan. Um, a media release by the City of Port, Port Phillip on the 23rd of August um, states that council is offering up to 5,000 per week till the 31st of December to local music venues and promoters who must cancel gigs due to lockdowns and 250 per performance to artists. The City of Port Phillip Council is responsible for providing the services and infrastructure required by most residents. Live music events in the city are not accessible to most residents, nor required by them. The Don't Stop the Music Lockdown Assistance Scheme is not the responsibility of Council. The federal and state governments have programs in place to provide financial assistance to businesses and individuals negatively impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. And Chairman, the, the, the federal and state, I'm uh, sorry, um, what, is, what is Council's justification for providing a special interest group in the music industry with additional financial assistance over that provided by the federal and state governments to all eligible businesses and displaced workers. What is Council's justification for spending the funds of ratepayers who are also negatively impacted by COVID-19 pandemic by providing additional support to a special interest group in the music industry? Madam Chairman, while you may think live music is a massive part of our city, it can only be enjoyed by a small number of the city's residents. 
Live music should never be given precedence when council is allocating ratepayers' funds to the services infrastructure required by most residents, for example, to amenity and public safety and diverting waste from landfill. The statement, please don't stop the music, is funded by savings from the calculation of the 2021 St Kilda Festival is nonsense. All savings in 2021 have been allocated to the services and infrastructure listed in the 2021-22 budget. The live music proposal will draw funds from the services and infrastructure planned for 21. Madam Chairman, Council has recently budgeted to increase the rates of property owners in the city. It is incumbent on Council to ensure that that increase is only used to fund services and infrastructure required by most residents. Thank you. Uh, I now call upon Fraser Reed Smith speaking to item 10.2, which is the council proposal for consideration by DOT's pop up bike lane program for funding and delivery. Fraser, are you there? Uh, yes, I am. Uh, my name is Fraser Reed Smith. Um, I live in, in Melbourne, 3004. Okay, great. If you've got three minutes, then, sir. Thank you, Mayor. Mayor, councillors, I speak in support of proposals outlined in item 10.2 which proposes that the council seek funding and delivery from DOT for the four pop-up bike lanes proposed, namely the three shimmy routes together with Park Street West, Route K, and the Bay Trail to Murray Street connection. There is no doubt that the significant increase in the level of bike traffic in the past decade and a half will continue to grow. Bikes provide a low cost, environmentally friendly, and a convenient mode of travel. The proposal recognises this trend. It will improve local access in the city of Port Phillip and assist in lowering the ever increasing level of traffic congestion. The pro proposal will also be good for local businesses. While the necessary DOT processes and delivery will inevitably take some time to be completed, Council should proceed with the proposals for a permanent protected by corridor in Park Street East and put these plans out for public consultation in the near future. This is an essential bike link between East and West and critical to the overall effectiveness of the bike network in the City of Port Phillip and should not be delayed. My only other comment is in regard to the Route K proposal. I've heard this described as the Shrine to Sea bike route. This is patently not the case, as it will take cyclists nowhere near the shrine. The shrine to sea route is down Elbert Road. Thank you. Thank you, Fraser. I now call upon Peter Denson speaking to the same item 10.2, which is the council proposals for DOT's pop-up bike program. Peter. Uh, through you, Mayor, if you would like to move to the next speaker, we're just um, helping Peter through some technical issues. Great. Uh, I'll call upon Frida Ehrlich speaking to item 10.2, the council proposal for the pop-up bike lanes. Hi, Frida. Uh, hi. Can you hear me? Yes, indeed, we can. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Frida Ehrlich, St Kilda. Good evening and thank you, Mayor and councillors, for the opportunity to also lend my support to item 10.2. Now, as a resident and bike rider, I use my bike to commute and for exercise. I endorse the proposal for the following reasons. Uh, these pop-up lanes would contribute to my safety and amenity whilst riding my bike. They'll also attract a lot of other range of people to use these paths from beginners to more experienced people and make routes safer for all users, including car users. In these times of restricted income to council, and this is, I think, my most important um, emphasis to councillors, these bike lanes will be totally funded by the Department of Transport, so they are extremely cost effective. In fact, the as item 7.1 states, the funding and delivery of these proposals will generate cost savings to council of up to $300,000. Uh, thirdly, they will align with many of council plan directions, including the integrated transport strategy, health and wellbeing strategies, 
and um, COVID safe strategies. There, fourthly, there's minimal loss of parking spaces. I think only four, 13 are muted. Uh, fifthly, the resultant reduction in emissions by more people choosing active transport aligns with Council declaration of climate emergency and the recent IPCC urgent message to the world to reduce emissions now. Sixth, as uh, Fraser said, there is data to support that uh, more bike people uh, riding on these local paths will be very good for local businesses. In short, councillors, it's a win-win for council, residents and visitors. And finally, I just want to thank the council officers for all their hard work. I think it's a really thorough and positive re re uh, report and I'm sure we'll have the best chance of state government funding our particular um, lanes. Thank you, Mayor and Councillors. Thanks, Frida. Uh, I call upon Karen Bain speaking to item, well, two items, but firstly to item 10.2, which is the council proposal for the pop-up bike lanes program. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Karen Baines and I live in South Melbourne. Um, firstly, I speak on item 10.2. I fully support councillors endorsing the proposal to seek funding and delivery from DOT for the four pop-up bike lanes outlined in the report tabled in item 10.2 at tonight's meeting. This will result in a safer network of bike lanes and connections within Port Phillip, considerable community benefits and shall not be at ratepayers' expense. I would like it clarified, however, as to whether the Route K, the Moray Street to St Kilda Road path is to be included and known as the Shrine to Sea route, as has been indicated at some level, as it does not directly link the two, as Fraser pointed out. The other route via the existing bike paths in Albert Road North and associated with Anzac Station is the logical and direct connection from Kingsway to St Kilda Road and the Shrine and should be identified as being part of this Shrine to Sea route. The Route K connection must also not be considered a viable alternative to the Park Street East bike path, as has been suggested by some community members as each path will result in a differing catchment of cyclists. Finally, the seeking of funding for this DOT program should not be used to stall the Park Street East project from progressing. It is understood that this is in design currently and due to return to council soon, ahead of being put out to public consultation. The opportunity for the community to um, comment on this is eagerly awaited. Um, I'd also like to speak um, to item 14.3, which is the proposed planning reforms. As a member of the community who has actively participated in planning matters and appeared at several VCAT hearings over recent years, I believe it is paramount that the local community is actively engaged on going replanning issues in Port Phillip, is consulted and has an opportunity to contribute to all proposed planning reforms at both local and state government level. Therefore, I wish to thank Councillor Crawford for raising this matter and I ask all councillors to support the motion tabled. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karen. Okay, we're going to try and get Peter Denson on now. With you, Peter, are you with us? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? We can. Peter, if you could state your name and suburb, and you're speaking to the DOT pop up bike lanes. Uh, Peter Denson, St Kilda West. My submission's in regard to item 10.2. My submission is a, an objection to the proposal until the Cowderoy and Park Street evening rat rain traffic is resolved, including needs to be included in Council's plans. Cowderoy and Park Streets are already unsafe at usual pre-pandemic high traffic volumes, 
with 10% speed in cars. Adding additional cyclists will make it even more unsafe for future cyclists. For instance, who gives way to whom on these two roundabouts when both roundabouts are regularly jammed full with the evening rat running traffic? There isn't any detail on the proposed bike locations southward from Langmore Street, Longmore Street to York Street. These future cyclists will encounter the Cowderoy Street westbound evening rat running traffic at some location between Longmore and York Street. This is clearly an unsafe proposal in our residents' view. Item 10.2, sub item 4.4 of the proposal outlines council officers are to take into account the fourth dot point, which is road user safety, making roads safe safer. This proposal doesn't produce safer roads in our opinion. From our residents' seven year experience of rat running traffic, adding more cyclists to both roundabouts will be an unsafe outcome and thus we believe item 10.2 should not proceed until our area is made safe for all. Additionally, there's been no council public consultation with us residents regarding these bike path locations. This is not a safe integrated residence, cars and bicycle plan. It only looks at future cyclists who will predominantly only be passing through our area. We residents have had enough of six to eight years of rat running traffic without resolution. Council keeps deferring a solution and there is no confirmed resolution. It appears to the residents the council just keeps kicking the can down the road. We're in, we're in favour of cyclists and bike paths, but when it's done properly, thank you for taking your time for my submission. Thanks, Peter. I call upon Karim Benkarain uh, speaking to item 10.3, which is the St Kilda Marina Community Engagement Outcomes. Hi, Karim. Good evening, and good evening, councillors and community members. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak this evening. My name is Karen Becker and I'm the um, Senior Development Manager leading the St Kilda Marina Redevelopment on behalf of the Australian Marina Development Corporation. I wanted to use this opportunity to thank Council and their team for their great effort leading the community engagement process. Uh, we also wanted to use the opportunity to thank the community for their valuable participation and incredibly helpful suggestions towards ensuring the development of the St Kilda Marina um, as a world-class and iconic destination, which enriches the local area and creates a lasting um, benefit to the community. Um, AMDC are committed to that vision and are considering all of the wonderful suggestions that have been proposed. And um, as we progress the design and we encourage the community to continue to engage with us along the journey, via our website and social media platforms, um, which are soon to be launched. Um, that's, um, that was all I really wanted to share with, um, with council and community members, and thank you again. Thanks, Karim. I now call upon Rod Walker speaking to item 11.1, .1, which is the Community Electric Vehicle Charging Permit. Hi, Rod. Hello, Louise. How are you doing? I'm really well. Thank you kindly for asking. Right, if you um, could state your name and suburb and then you've got three minutes to speak to the report. Sure. My name is Rod Walker. I'm the inventor of Curb Charge, the subject of the electric vehicle charging permit at 11.1. .1. And what's your like... suburb, Rod, just generally? I'm sorry, I'm from, I'm from Williamstown. Great. Continue on. I would like to thank the Council for supporting Curb Charge. It is the first personal rather than public on-street electric vehicle charging solution. Indeed, my patent attorney advised me after extensive searches, both in Australia and overseas, that it is unique and quite probably the first anywhere. This trial will mean Port Phillip will be the first jurisdiction to have a working example. I want to express my sincere thanks to your senior sustainability officer, Remy Rulane. He understood the significance of the model and has been an unwavering supporter over the past 18 months, recognising the benefits it will afford to residents with no off-street electric vehicle charging access, which frankly is a very large number, 
and may otherwise be tempted to simply string an unsafe extension cord over the front fence. Energy Safe Victoria have also been closely involved over the same period as the support for the concept was essential. Approval from both bodies will have to occur for each and every installation. Therefore, Council and ESV will always have veto power, not just for the pilot, but into the future. The use permit you will be voting on tonight is, in my view, a very good document. However, the last change that I only became aware of last Friday poses a significant problem. This change calls for a two-year trial period with only a maximum of five residents for those two years. If adopted, it will have the unintended consequence of delaying electric vehicle adoption and significantly disadvantage Port Phillip residents in their desire to change to charge their electric vehicles from the standpoint of cost, convenience and importantly, safety. We expected and anticipated the trial to run for a maximum of three months and would install curb charge for free for the trial period, at the end of which the trial participants could either continue with curb charge, in which case they would be given a bill for half the price of installation, or elect to discontinue use and we would return the footpath or nature strip along with the resident's property to its original condition. In closing, my instincts and advice from those in the electric vehicle space is that curb charge has much to offer and will be widely adopted. I congratulate Port Phillip for being groundbreakers. It's always challenging to be the first. I just hope you recognise the opportunity and reconsider this completely unreasonable two-year trial period for it will unnecessarily delay EV adoption when all arms of government and most importantly, the environment calling for rapid action. So thank you for your time. Thanks, Rod. I call upon Deborah Sykes speaking to item 11.1, .1, the Community Electric Vehicle Charging Permit. Hi, Deborah. Hi, thank you. Please, if you could state your name and suburb and then please speak to the item. Sure. So my name's Deborah Sykes and I live in St Kilda West. Um, I own an electrical vehicle and I also have solar panels and I'm passionate about the environment and sustainable energy sources. However, I don't have off-street parking. So I am in generally, uh, generally in favour of the motion to trial EV charging from residences who, uh, which don't have off-street parking. However, I'm concerned by a number of issues. Given we know that there's well over 100 EVs in the city of Port Phillip and 27 of them have bothered to inquire about charging um, when they don't have off-street parking with council, uh, I really want to ask why we're only trialling five. Uh, what is the purpose of a trial? What are the measures of success? What are we looking for? We know there will be an upsurge of EVs over the next few years. All the data is showing that. And in addition, seeing the city of Port Phillip has signed up to the climate emergency, and we know that uh, transport makes between 11 and 17% of our emissions, this is a no brainer to encourage people to use EVs. It would assist our emissions in the city. Except being an inner city suburb, like so many, we don't, not all residences have off-street parking. Um, so in this way, the city of Port Phillip can be a leader. In addition, as stated before, why is it two years? Surely three to six months would um, identify any issues better. Like two years is a really long time. And in that time, there'll be more and more EVs purchased and being utilised in the area. And I'm not sure if, how those people are expected to utilise uh, their energy uh, from their homes. It's quite inconvenient, time consuming and um, inefficient to always go to uh, public charging stations like in the in the um, the market or some of the hotels around the place. We know that streets with off-street parking have informal ways of parking as far as neighbours go. You know, I'll be always parking in my street anyway and I won't be taking up extra space. 
So there's a kind of a informal system of parking anyway. EVs don't need to be in the being charged 100% of the time while they're parked. So you don't need this spot for 100% of the time. So my, my thoughts, two years is excessive. We know it's happening anyway. We know, I see it all the time, as I'm sure you guys do, that people are stringing their um, electric cords over their fence. It's dangerous. We need a legal way to charge EVs. Deborah, I will have to ask you to wrap up, if okay. you could. Yep. I'm on my last sentence. I would okay. encourage the City of Port Phillip to be ahead of the pack and show the way inner city living means we need to address this issue now. Thanks. Thank you very much. I now call on Joseph Betros speaking to item 12.2, the St Kilda Festival 2022. Hi, Joseph. Hi, Mayor. Thanks for having me. Yeah, Joseph, if you could state your name and suburb and then please take your three minutes. Sure. So my name is Joseph Batros. Um, I'm actually speaking on behalf of JMC Academy tonight. We're situated in South Melbourne, but I'm also an Elwood resident, so I'm speaking as a local too. Um, so I'm the um, I'm the creative outreach coordinator at JMC Academy in Melbourne. Um, we have a really strong relationship with the city of Port Phillip, uh, having recently partnered on the St Kilda Film Festival. Um, we actually hosted the Big Picture Day at our campus in South Melbourne. Um, JMC provides tertiary education to over 400 students in various creative fields, including music, film and TV, game, and games and animation. Uh, we support the St Kilda Festival taking place in 2022 and the general return to large scale events next year. As we all know, the events industry has been hit incredibly hard and we believe a flourishing music and event scene is pivotal for our students and alumni, particularly those who have recently graduated and face an uncertain future. More broadly, we believe the return to a culturally vibrant city post-vaccination will be a pivotal part of the road to recovery. For our students, uh, industry development and opportunity to learn through internships and on-the-job experience is a cornerstone to their training, and we know that they're very much looking forward to getting back to, the, um, back to working on the ground. We value our relationship with the City of Port Phillip, and we hope to see the event go ahead in 2022. Thanks so much. Thanks, Joseph. Uh, I now call on Kate Duncan, also speaking to item 12.2, St Kilda Festival 2022. Hi, Kate. Hi, can you hear me okay? We can. Kate, if you could state your name and suburb and then please speak. Thank you, Kate Duncan, Preston. Uh, this evening I'm speaking in my capacity as CEO of youth music organisation, The Push Incorporated, in support of the delivery of the 2022 St Kilda Festival. The PUSH is a registered charity and national youth music organisation based in Melbourne. We support young people to participate with industry pathways and all ages music events across the contemporary music industry. The PUSH has partnered with the City of Port Phillip on St Kilda Festival for 10 years. And as one of our signature annual events, St Kilda Festival is an important opportunity, not only for young artists to perform and reach new audiences, but for young industry practitioners to get hands-on experience in working on an event of its scale. In addition to the benefits for young artists and industry practitioners, St Kilda Festival is an accessible event for thousands of young people to attend by the nature of it being free and all ages. I'm sure it doesn't surprise you to hear that young people have been disproportionately impacted over the last 18 months by COVID-19. During this time, the youth unemployment rate has risen to 16.4% nationally, and young people are currently almost twice as likely to be unemployed as our general population. The flow on, effect, the flow on effects of remote learning and high youth unemployment rates have had a devastating impact on young people's mental wellbeing and connection to community more broadly. As the, local, as the level of government closest to young people in our communities, local government can play a critical role in supporting young people to maintain positive mental wellbeing, access employment and pathways, and develop transferable skills that will be required for a COVID normal world. As we plan for how our industry re-emerges after these last 18 months, St Kilda Festival can and should play an important role in supporting young people to connect and access important performance and pathways that they have missed during this period. Opportunities for young people to attend safe and accessible events like St Kilda Festival is important now more than ever. Thank you. Thanks, Kate. I call upon Anne Byrne speaking to 12.2 of the St Kilda Festival 2022. How are you, Anne? 
I'm well, thank you. Can, you can hear me. We, we can indeed. <laughs> you know the drill, please. I do. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak this evening. My name is Anne Byrne and I live in St Kilda. My comments relate to item 12.2, the St Kilda Festival. As we continue in lockdown and start to contemplate a world where we can leave, leave the house for more than four reasons, we need to see the opportunity for joy. We really need some joy in our city. And thinking about the St Kilda Festival from this perspective, the only option that we think should be considered is option two, to have two smaller St Kilda events at different periods in 2022. It would allow a St Kilda Festival and maybe a not the St Kilda Festival to occur in another part of our city. This would broaden the spread of joy. Two smaller festivals would also enable a focus on two different musical experiences. experiences. Option two is the best option as it is more likely to be able to be organised in a COVID safe way with smaller crowds, flexibility and timing of events and therefore a greater likelihood of achieving at least one festival if lockdowns are still being used. In addition, smaller scale festivals are more likely to be acceptable to the state government, which will still, still be cautious about large scale events. It also opens the possibility for later dates when vaccination rates will be high and the events will have an even greater level of safety. We don't support the fact of not having a festival. The problem with option three is there is a total loss of opportunity for a music festival and loss of spirit and joy that outdoor festivals bring and will further contribute to the very dead atmosphere in St Kilda in our great city. So in accepting option two, council should direct the investigation to also include community consultations and a particularly consultation and involvement of local music musicians and artists which we noticed was miss missing in the consultation uh, paper. Therefore, pre please resolve to support option two for the St Kilda Festival in 2022. Thank you. Thanks, Anne. I call upon Janet Rosenberg speaking to item 12.2, the St Kilda Festival 2022. Good evening, Janet. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, you're just a little bit faint. If you could speak up a little bit, that would be great. And if you could, you know the drill. Okay, thanks so please. much. Is that better? That's better, thank you. Okay, I'm Janet Rosenberg, President of Ackland Street Village Business Association and I run a business in St Kilda. The Ackland Traders support the St Kilda Festival going ahead as a nine day event in February 2022. Delivering music and entertainment in a different format to the past is an exciting opportunity to refresh the festival, bringing music back to St Kilda while at the same time supporting our beleaguered traders, our creative artists, musicians and our venues. Continuing the festival is imperative to rebuilding St Kilda as a centre of live music in Port Phillip. We are renowned for putting on this festival. It's one of the last free community music festivals and it should continue in whatever format can work under COVID safe event guidelines. It is an opportunity to showcase in the summer all that St Kilda has to offer and will draw much needed tourists to our area. The return of the festival will also bring opportunities for much needed revenue to our traders. A new format could be a chance to really incorporate the existing businesses into the festival, maybe by including music in venues and by not allowing outside traders. This would create an immediate positive economic impact for our struggling businesses. It will direct more business to those who have suffered enormously with lockdowns and who will continue to suffer with a huge decrease in tourists, even when the economy slowly opens. We are all aware St Kilda has had a massive decrease in tourists, which our businesses rely on. We need events to bring people back to the area and the festival will do that. We know there is always going to be a risk of the threat of lockdowns. But last summer, we were able to be open when the virus seemed to be less active and this summer, we expect higher vaccination rates. This is the best time for people to enjoy St Kilda and hosting the festival would have a positive impact on our community's wellbeing as it's, as it's a sign that things can return to some sort of normal. A nine day event would also allow us to experiment with new ways to bring music to the area. Ideas can be explored for spaces to be used more constructively for entertainment, such as the Ackland Plaza, which has been underutilised in the past. 
Music is part of St Kilda's heritage. A new format for the festival will make music more vibrant and accessible, create a truly wonderful and alive vibe for the area, while supporting artists, the creative sector, and the businesses that make up this community. Please bring back the festival for 2022. Life must go on. Thank you. Thanks, Janet. I call upon David Blakely speaking to the St Kilda Fest 2022 item. Hi, David. Hi, it's Louise. David Blakely, um, Fitzroy Street Traders Association President, um, Mayor and Councillors. I'm hearing the talk today in favour of the St Kilda Festival, re returning in 2022. Um, in line with the state and federal government roadmap to um, the COVID roadmap, I believe that the first two options presented by the Council officers make mean that the St Kilda Festival should be achievable next year with it with minimum um, financial risk and to, to the council and a, a, a minimum sort of PR slash COVID risk. Um, the, the, the first two options are St Kilda Festival on a smaller scale than previously seen, which I believe shall offer greater benefit to individual traders um, with more focus on local traders, residents and artists. Um, it's no um, secret that St Kilda, particularly probably more than any other area than in Port Phillip, has been badly affected by COVID. And we've continued continued lockdowns this year, um, a reduction in tourists, um, artists, businesses and workers are desperate. Um, I think the, the return to St Kilda Festival ties in well with our music plan. And as, as Janet said, it's the soul of St Kilda. It's, um, it's, it's what makes St Kilda, what makes St Kilda different from other areas in the, in the, in the city of Port Phillip. And I think it's, it's, really, it's something that's desperately needed. Um, I'd like to thank the council officers who worked on this plan. They've worked well with the trader groups, um, key music um, players. And um, I think there's a strength gain by working with us as a group as we get maximum benefit for all parties. Um, thank you very much. Thanks, David. Uh, I call upon Julia Robinson speaking to item 12.2 St Kilda Festival 2022. Hi, Julia. Hi, thanks. Can you hear me? Yes, Julia, if you could please state your name and suburb and then you've got three minutes to speak. Certainly. My name is Julia Robinson. I'm on Wurundjeri land in Fitzroy North. Um, I'm the general manager of the Australian Festival Association, and I'm here in the capacity um, as a um, as a representative from the festival industry from a national perspective. My comments are made with regard to the St Kilda Festival. Festivals are much loved by Australians. They're attended by 46% of all Australians over the age of 15, and one in four attend music festivals. In 2019, Ernst & Young valued the Australian festival industry at $2.7 billion. It employs just over 9,000 full-time equivalent workers. Last year, these figures plummeted by 86%. Arguably, 2021 has been even harder for the festival industry with rolling lockdowns devastating the sector already at its knees. Festivals like St Kilda Festival can become the lifeblood of a community. All levels of government benefit from the inclusion of festivals on the calendars and therefore play a role in supporting this industry in its return following the COVID-19 crisis. The Australian Festival Association supports the um, inclusion of the changes to the festival format for the St Kilda Festival um, and would like to um, so fully support the submission made by the St Kilda Festival. Thank you. I call upon Mary Stewart speaking to item 12.2 St Kilda Festival 2022. Hi, Mary. Hello, Mayor and Councillors. My name is Mary Stewart. I live and work in St Kilda uh, and um, I speak on behalf of Luna Park, uh, the Foreshore Traders, St Kilda Tourism and Events Association, uh, and also uh, tender apologies from uh, Travis Atkins and um, Donovan's, the Stokehouse and the Seabards. Uh, on behalf of all of those uh, groups and individuals, uh, we seek to support uh, the recommendation um, in the um, 
report to council uh, option 1A uh, and or 1B. Uh, in short, we think that uh, 1A um, is uh, the preferred uh, option. Uh, however, it is insightful that an inclusion of 1B uh, is able to cater for what might be subject to circumstances. Uh, and option 1A and or 1B, if it has to be held later in the year, uh, links activities from uh, Ackland Street through to South Beach Reserve and into Fitzroy Street. The option uh, is an alternative, it's an innovative alternative uh, to the traditional mega uh, St Kilda festival event and in its modified form it is an innovative response to the circumstances that confront uh, not just festivals, but communities and uh, businesses. So we support the initiative uh, and recommend option 1A to Council. It provides the capacity to both reinvent and recover. We are particularly supportive of uh, the focus uh, on uh, working closely with uh, local traders and businesses and that um, uh, whilst you have uh, the capacity to have slightly smaller um, uh, gated events, uh, it allows uh, a, um, an event and a series of um, activities to occur in a manner that can be held consistent with COVID safe uh, operating requirements and uh, capacity restrictions. So we recommend uh, to the council that the council uh, adopt option one. Thank you. I call upon Joyce Pressure uh, speaking to item 12.2, St Kilda Festival 2022. Good evening, Joyce. Good evening. Um, can you hear me, Louise? We can, Joyce. If you could state your name and suburb and then yeah. please speak. Um, I'm Joyce Pressure and I'm from Elwood. Um, firstly, I wanted to thank you, Louise, and the council for all the incredible things that you've been doing for the music community. It's muchly appreciated. I'm also speaking in support of the St Kilda Festival to go ahead in 2022. My preferred option would be option 1A, um, but with that said, I'll go further into it. Um, as a musician, as well as a community member that pre-COVID brought live music to the council on a regular basis, I really wanted to share my point of view on this topic. I think it's really important to go ahead with the festival in any shape or form. I think like me, um, many would have loved a really big event like pre 2021, but I do realize that there are, these are different times and we need to be creative in how to make it work. Um, but I think any form of festival is far better than no festival. But with that said, my preference would be February because I kind of think that festivals are very suited for the summer period and we still have beautiful weather. So, um, I've got, um, a couple of things that I think are important. A, I think we need to continue putting St Kilda and Bayside events and venues on the map as there continues to be this notion that live music in the council is dead. Um, I have lived in the council for over a decade and I've many times heard statements from other musicians or people that are living in other parts of the city around there being no music in our council and many seem to think that music happens in other parts of town. But we have wonderful venues here in the city of Port Phillip. I've played in many. And we have an amazing festival that attracts music lovers and incredibly talented artists far beyond the borders of this council. We also really have an opportunity here to support our local musicians and venues, and they've been doing it very tough. Um, many are without jobs at the moment, and many feel very support, unsupported during this time. And there's a really negative, like I, I really sense that I've got a lot of musician um, friends that are really struggling. Um, events continue to be cancelled with every lockdown. We have reduced capacity in venues between the lockdowns, which means less revenue. And therefore there's reduced or no income for those in the industry. And that doesn't just involve the musicians, it involves the venues, it involves everyone that's working behind the scenes, bookers, people that are putting the event together. There's a lot that goes into these events. Um, I think it's really important to support these musicians, venues, the local trade, music lovers and the city of Port Phillip as a whole. I think we really all need this and I believe the festival will bring live music and trade to the council. 
Um, I think there's a real risk at the moment of losing very talented artists who simply can't keep going without support. Everyone is feeling very deflated and not sure how to move forward. There are people in the music industry who are changing their career paths, and these are very talented people um, because they can't put any food on the table anymore. They can't afford their rent. Um, and we may think that music is of less importance and that it's a nice to have, but I personally can't imagine a world without music. Thank you. Thanks, Joyce. I now call on Dale Packard, also speaking to item 12.2, which is the St Kilda Festival 2022. Hi, Dale. Hi, Dale Packard from The Patch. I'm the General Manager of Music Victoria, an independent not-for-profit organisation and the state peak body for contemporary music. We represent musicians, venues, music businesses and professionals and music lovers across the Victorian music community. I want to applaud Council on the Live Music Action Plan and current initiatives such as Please Don't Stop the Music and also show my support for item 12.2, the St Kilda Festival 2022 proposal and the intention to extend the event to a nine day festival. Uh, this will be a high impact festival with huge benefits to St Kilda, as well as providing engagement and employment for everyone involved in live events from artists to crew to suppliers and everyone in between. Over the last decade, we have seen Melbourne develop into the live music capital of the world with the largest number of venues of any city, venues that are safe and well run, venues hosting a great diversity of live music. The industry, this industry, which generates an annual statewide economic generation of 1.4 billion and delivers at least a three to one return on investment, is now under existential threat. We have sadly seen this sector shrink to around 5% of pre-COVID levels. Uh, we've seen businesses close, skilled artists and crew leave to other industries. High profile events like St Kilda Festival are a crucial component to getting the creative sector back on track. And as you'll be very aware, local governments need to find initiatives like this to bring people back out of their homes and to support local businesses. From a health and wellbeing point of view, we need to create spaces where people can connect again and share experiences. We all have a role to play in navigating these next few years. This includes federal, state and local governments. And if we do this right, I expect we'll see a thriving music culture in the city of Port Phillip in the years to come. Thank you, Dale. Uh, so now we've received um, further submissions, which will be read out on behalf of members of the public. So I'll call out the name of the member of the public and refer to the head of governance, Kirsty, to uh, read a summary of the submissions. So the first one are, are two questions. Um, one's from Adrian Jackson. Kirsty. Through you, Mayor, and the submission reads, if lockdowns continue to cancel events, ratepayers should ratepayers funds should only be paid to local venues, local promoters, and live music artists who live in Port Phillip. Will council ensure that ratepayers do not subsidise promoters, staging crews, and artists from outside the municipality? Uh, Kylie Bennett to respond. Through you, Mayor, the Please Don't Stop the Music Lockdown Assistance Scheme is part of Council's Live Music Action Plan. Through this initiative, Council will provide financial contributions to assist venues, promoters, event managers and artists with the sunk cost of cancelled gigs or the cost to reschedule live music events affected by lockdown. Venues based in the City of Port Phillip are eligible to apply as are artists, booking agents and promoters who are able to demonstrate the cancellation or a confirmed gig in a City of Port Phillip venue. Musicians who wish to register for Council's Live Music Support Scheme must demonstrate evidence that they live, work, study or volunteer in the City of Port Phillip. Thank you. Uh, we have a second question from Adrian Jackson. Through you, Mayor, the question reads, why is much of our rates spent on planting in other parts of the city, like Fitzroy Street, but Middle Park Shopping Strip gets less attention despite Middle Park ratepayers paying high rates to the council? Can council take action to fix this matter promptly as spring is about to be with us? And I note that Mr Jackson provided a range of photos of plantations in Middle Park and an explanation of works required. This information has been shared with councillors and will be forwarded to the relevant officers. Uh, Lachlan Johnson to respond. Uh, through you, Mayor, I'd like to thank Adrian Jackson for bringing this matter to the attention of council officers. Um, officers will assess the sites identified by Adrian Jackson when it's safe to do so um, and will take the suggestions into consideration when determining suitable plants for this location. 
and we'll prioritise these works during the spring planting season subject to the availability of the plants. Thank you. Uh, we've now got uh, Peter Tanner speaking to item 10.3, which is the St Kilda Marina Project Community Engagement Outcomes. Through you, Mayor, the submission reads, the latest community engagement outcomes for the St Kilda Marina Project only refers to the previous community engagement outcomes, but does not compare results on key themes. I particularly note the following themes. One, importance of seating and shade. The previous online survey that had a higher contribution rate made no mention of shade. It specifically featured the importance of views into and within the site and minimising build form. This is a foreshore location, very similar to a beach where shade should not be a priority feature. People go to foreshore locations for the sun and vitamin D enhancement, not to be seated in the shade. Shade may be a desirable feature when the boat launching occurs, which is a visual site feature. Two, activities and programmed events. The previous online survey noted more participant comments were in opposition to the provision of public event space, stating that there was already sufficient event space. As a 30 year resident of Marine Parade and a member of the former St Kilda Marina community panel, I would suggest that the low contribution rate experienced within the latest online survey was not due to the community being comfortable with the redevelopment direction, but rather being disappointed with the final outcome. For example, all of the massing scenarios contained within the final community panel process outcomes report on page 38 were not close to the accepted tender. Uh, and we've also got uh, a statement to be read out from Adrian Jackson in regards to St Kilda Festival 2022. And the submission reads, I support option three, cancelling next year's festival given the increasing concern with COVID-19 there is no point planning and spending ratepayer funds on something that will not happen. The money saved by cancelling the festival should remain in the council's bank account and not be spent on something else. If council proceeds with the festival and it is cancelled at the last minute, councillors will be held accountable for this waste of ratepayers funds. Also a statement in regards to St Kilda Festival from James Shanahan. In the submission reads, I am a managing director for Deluxe Audio based in South Bank and resident in St Kilda East. Deluxe has provided audio equipment and backline musical equipment for many live stages at St Kilda Festival since 2008. St Kilda Festival is a massive part of our year and we are incredibly hopeful for a triumphant return in 2022. We can't imagine the nightmare it must be trying to pivot the festival from the original well-oiled machine it was, but it's importance not only to all events related businesses, but local businesses and general punters cannot be understated. I am greatly concerned that if the 2022 festival is cancelled without an attempt to pivot, then I fear it could end up cancelled forever. The crew and suppliers may not survive another year of missed opportunity, 18 months of lockdowns, reduced capacity, national touring difficulties, complete loss of international touring being 60% of our income, and we along with every other events business in the country are on the brink. We have managed to turn over only 14% of our expected turnover comparative to the previous 18 months for our event related income. This is actually a high figure compared to other staging specialists who are closer to one to 3%. Many of these companies own 2 million or more worth of equipment. We cannot even sell gear to get buyers who would buy it. The situation is dire and without targeted support from governments, it will only get worse. We don't want handouts. We want to work and do what we do best. The best thing government can do is put on events and help to reboot local recovery efforts for all involved in the supply chain. And especially your local St Kilda punter who wants to see some bands on the foreshore in the sunset after a couple of beers at the ESPY. I think we all do, James. I think we all do. Um, so we're going to hear a statement from Simon Myers, also uh, talking to St Kilda Festival 2022. And the submission reads, Memo Music Hall fully supports the return of the St Kilda Festival in a nine day format. The St Kilda Festival had, I believe, reached the point of no return and failed to represent a celebration of community spirit. Necessity is the mother of invention. Changing the format of the festival to a nine day festival is an opportunity to move forward, reclaim the community spirit and get the heart of entertainment in St Kilda beating again. 
inspiring performances that are creative and accessible being infused with a healthy disrespect for establishment and the status quo has in my opinion always been the backbone of local music and entertainment in St Kilda. That being said I think we can with myself included get caught up in the good old days. They have well and truly passed the presentation of a newly formatted nine day festival St Kilda Festival is an opportunity to kickstart a new chapter in St Kilda's ever-changing music and entertainment scene and hopefully encourage an organic progression to something fresh that inspires a new generation of musicians and entertainers to call St Kilda their home. And we have one more submission from uh, John Tabart. Uh, through you, Mayor John Tabart, representing the G12 Plus Domain Precinct Residence Group, speaking to item 10.2 Council proposal for consideration by the Department of Transport's pop up bike lane program. And the submission reads, many of us are recreational cyclists and support safe cycling in the Gateway Ward and across all wards in Port Phillip. The concept in general seems to be good, will provide safer recreational and destination cycle routes and is funded mainly by the state so it is not a contributor to increased rates. On that basis we support the general thrust of this proposal. We however have three concerns we would like addressed. One, the Park Street West pop-up. Number two, in the traffic and parking assessment seems ill-considered as this will become a tram route in the near future and vehicle lanes will reduce and like Park Street East will not be an effective cycle route with these impacts. Number two, the Moray Street to St Kilda Road connector. Route K in the traffic and parking assessment also the Shrine to Sea connecting route is far more important than a pop-up and in fact should replace the erroneous placement of a bike route in Park Street East or any overflow into Albert Road North, both of which due to existing and future uses, the Anzac Station and Tram Superstop are substantially unable to handle a bike route. Number three, Park Street East, not part of the pop-up bike lane program. The substantial new redevelopment of sites along Park Street East will provide many new retail shops, cafes and restaurants and we cannot allow the footpath path to be reduced to only three metres wide. Seven redevelopment sites have already sought and or received permits or are potential applicants with three existing shops or restaurants on the southern side of Park Street. Ten redevelopment sites have already sought and or received permits or are potential applicants including two existing shops and one restaurant cafe on the northern side of Park Street along the Park Street East Road. These developments will ensure it becomes a new retail restaurant and services stripped in our precinct. The proposal requires reducing the Park Street footpath on both sides of the street to a three metre width from the current six metres. This will prevent outdoor trading and social gatherings so crucial to our residential community. Before the eventual development of Fisherman's Bend, this precinct is the dense, densest residential area in Port Phillip and it needs proper precinct planning as we have advocated since 2014. We are concerned that this pop-up bike lane program by its structure assumes that Park Street East and overflow into Albert North Road are accepted, accepted outcomes. We oppose this in the strongest terms. Thank you. So that uh, completes public question time and submissions. So councillors, we're moving to councillor question time. Do I have, um, if you want to pop, do you have any questions for officers? I'm not seeing any questions or I'm missing any, I'll just go back up. All right, if there are no questions, we'll move along to the ceiling schedule. So councillors, we have a ceiling schedule report that has been added to the agenda as a late report 6.1, which is Procurement Australia contract. Are there any questions of the officers in relation to this report? Councillors, if there are no questions, we have an officer's recommendation. Would someone like to move this or something different? Councillor Pearl to move and Councillor Bond to second. Councillor Pearl, would you like to speak to the motion? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, Councillor Bond. Uh, no, thank you. Would anyone else like to speak to the motion? No, if not, we'll then just put it to the vote. Uh, Councillor Baxter. Four. 
Councillor Bond? Four. Councillor Clark? Four. Councillor Copsey? Four. Councillor Crawford? Four. Councillor Consolo? Four. Councillor Martin? Four. Councillor Pearl? In favour. Councillor Sirikoff? Four. That motion is passed. For the first time in ages, councillors, we have no petitions or joint letters on tonight's agenda, so we'll move to 8, point, uh, 8 to 14, which is the presentation of reports. So let's move to the first one, which is report number 10.1, which is the road management plan. Councillors, do we have any questions of the officers in relation to this report? I'm not seeing any question. Our question, Councillor Sirikoff. Councillor Sirikoff, I think you're on mute. Yes, uh, sorry, I'm just um, fixing my questions now. Um, road management plan, yes. Um, so uh, the report mentions that council will strengthen its position when uh, protecting road infrastructure from developers and utility providers who carry out planned works without any, uh, without notifying uh, council. But my question is, uh, will this strengthen, um, will this, will this strengthen uh, the position of council requiring developers or utility providers to per, to return foot baths to at least their original state, uh, notably original materials. And I'm just thinking of the example of the uh, mosaic stonework on, on the footpath in Fitzroy Street, which has been removed um, in sections by utility providers to only be backfilled with bitumen and destroying the aesthetics of the street. Uh, Mark Thompson. Yes, through you, Madam Mayor. That's correct. It actually will increase it. Council traditionally has not required utility providers to provide permits um, to undertake works under the Road Management Act. Permits are required for any planned works by utility providers that do works greater than eight square metres. So Fitzroy Strip would definitely be included where utility providers need to lodge a permit. There is a, a um, state government fever lodge in that permit, which is part of our fees and charges. So they would return for us, so for instance, um, with the stonework or the mosaic stonework, they'd have to return it back to its original state of mosaic stonework. Through you, Madam Mayor. The requirements under the Act is that they return it as per the condition prior to the works commencing. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Um, I've got a second question, if that's OK. Yes, of course. Uh, when it comes to uh, repairs and reconstruction of heritage, heritage infrastructure, such as uh, Bluestone uh, laneways, are there guidelines for how Bluestone laneways are to be relayed to allow rainfall to permeate um, between the Bluestone so as not to cause um, any flooding due to concrete material being used to uh, backfill between, uh, in the gaps between the Bluestones? Uh, in some laneways in, um, in say, Middle Park and Elbert Park, where there's concrete being backfilled between the gaps in bluestones, uh, this has caused issues for houses on bluestone laneways. Got a Mark Thompson again. Through you, Madam Mayor. Prior to us sealing any laneways or undertaking any reconstruction of our bluestone laneways, we undertake um, geotechnical investigation, which looks at the permeability of the soil underneath the laneway. A lot of our soils aren't permeable, and which builds up water. And also we've had a lot of issues regarding um, water penetrating underneath people's buildings where the permeability is. So we've got to be very cautious on what we do with our laneways. Every laneway is designed based on the geotechnical investigations. Thank you. Councillors, do we have any other questions? No other questions. Uh, we have an officer's recommendation. Do I have a mover, Councillor Copsey, to move? Oh, sorry, uh, Council, and then Councillor Pearl to second. Uh, Councillor Copsey, would you like to speak to the motion? No, thank you. Councillor Pearl? Well, oh, this is core business for Council, obviously, and this is the second time uh, this report's come. Council, whilst I've been around, and it's it's critically important that we get the right calibrations for this policy so that it stays in in place for a, a very long period of time. So it obviously goes on a website tomorrow and it's out for 28 days worth of consultation. So 
it'll be interesting to see what feedback um, we get. We got quite a lot last time when I think we looked at this in 2017, 2018. Um, th this is the core business of council and I'm very interested to see what feedback we get on the report. So um, please uh, have a quick read of it. It's quite a voluminous report, but please have a quick read of the executive summary at the front. And um, uh, importantly, anyone out there, please, uh, please submit your feedback because we're interested to hear from you. Great, thank you. Would any other councils like to speak for or against the motion? None. Councillor Copsey, would you like to close? No, thank you. All right, let's take that to the vote under division. Councillor Bond? Four. Councillor Clark? Four. Councillor Copsey? Four. Councillor Crawford? Four. Councillor Consolo? Four. Councillor Martin? Four. Councillor Pearl? In favour. Councillor Sirikoff? Four. Councillor Baxter? Four. That motion is carried. Uh, moving along to 10.2, which is the Council Proposals for Consideration by the Department of Transport's Pop-Up Bike Lane Program for Funding and Delivery. Councillors, do we have any questions for the officers on this report? Councillor Consolo. Thank you. For the three shimmy routes, what are the physical changes expected should this go ahead? Uh, Brian T. Uh, thank you, ma'am, um, and through you. Uh, the shimmy routes are very much a light touch. Uh, they involve um, signage, uh, street markings. Um, they are designed to increase, to make it easier for cyclists to see the uh, routes. And uh, more importantly, they are designed to make cars aware that there are cyclists in the area. Uh, they do not reduce the volume of uh, car traffic um, and they do not take up parking uh, bays. Um, there is uh, usually, there is no intention to have any physical barriers separating the cyclists from traffic. Are there any other questions? Councillor Martin. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Perhaps Mr T can answer this question. I've had a number of emails from concerned right road and there were some questions in public question time today as well. People seem to be concerned that this whole process of fate accompli and that they won't have an opportunity to have a consultation. Can Mr T tell us if the Department of Transport is going to be organising a consultation process so residents can have some input into the processes? Brian T. Um, thank you. And um, through um, you, uh, Mayor, um, the Department of Transport will engage uh, with a minimum of six weeks of um, community engagement uh, prior to uh, the commencement of any delivery of any of these bike corridors um, and council officers will work with the department to ensure that that engagement uh, is maximised in terms of the access that um, uh, is reached in terms of the number of people that are made aware of these um, uh, the, the proposed designs. Uh, Councillor Clark. Thanks, Madam Mayor. Uh, looking at the recommendation uh, that's in there, uh, one of it states that um, the council seeks a commitment um, from the department that they, um, for an opportunity for council officers to contribute local knowledge and technical expertise. So, uh, and also that seeks a commitment for the Department of Transport uh, to be funded and a process for design and community engagement. So. Um, it would seem from the comments in the papers that the council doesn't have any commitment from the Department of Transport at this point in time for being involved in the design or the engagement process. Is, is that correct? Brian T. Um, no, that the, um, uh, the state, uh, uh, the department and council have been working reasonably um, closely together. Uh, we are assured um, that the engagement, the public engagement, will also include an opportunity to work closely with council officers. Um, and we as council officers will make sure that our councillors are made aware of the designs as they progress. Councillor Pearl. 
Um, I'm a big fan of Route K. Just want to make you see how uh, how can you actually make that happen over the next few years and what the timeline would be in place to actually put that sort of route in place from a practical point of view. Sorry, what was the question, Councillor Pell? Just wanted to see what practicality in terms of getting Route K up would be in terms of timeline and cost. Brian T. So in, in some ways, the uh, timeline, we're in the hands of the department. They uh, assure us that they are keen to move this um, um, calendar year. Um, we are, Route K is out of all the designs, probably the one that is um, most underdone in the design. So it will take uh, more time, but we are hopeful that it will be um, at or around the same time as the others. So either late this year or early next year. Uh, in terms of the cost of design uh, and delivery, um, the, um, we are seeking an application for the department to fully fund the uh, proposal. There is no council um, funding allocated to this proposal. Do we have any further questions? I might ask a question if I may. Um, Mr T, there was mention that Route K is not necessarily the Shrine to Sea route. Is, is that something that would need to be clarified in our application to um, the Department of Transport? Um, through you, um, Mia, I might ask my colleague, John, um, who's been working on the Shrine to Sea proposal to um, respond to that question. Thanks. John Bartels. Uh, through you, Mayor. Um, we have had a number of discussions with the Department of Transport, um, as well as discussions with the Department of Environment, Land and Water and Planning, um, who are leading the Shrine to Sea project. Um, in terms of uh, application or request to the Department of Transport for funding and delivery of these proposals through their pop-up bike lane program, uh, we can make it clear in that request that um, it is not related to the Shrine to Sea project in, in terms of Route K. Um, and we believe at this stage that they are aware that it runs on a different alignment, um, but we can make that um, very clear in that application. Right. If I may ask a further question, um, there was uh, some concern around uh, funneling. I think I just wanted to clarify um, funneling more people into that uh, Cowderoy Street area. But it, can I clarify again, sorry, uh, that the Shimmy Roots is more to identify um, uh, or warn people that there are cyclists travelling through as opposed to trying to funnel additional bike riders at this point? Thank you. Through you, Mayor. Um, that is right. Um, the proposal for that street uh, is for a Shimmy Route. It is for signage. Um, it is for painted road markings. It is designed to make people, including drivers, particularly drivers, more aware of um, uh, cycling activity. Um, it is not designed to remove um, cars or indeed remove the space for cars on those roads. Are there any further questions, councillors? I have one more quick one, if I may. Just to also clarify, Mr. T, um, as part of the consultation process, there it is. It is. Um, it is a genuine uh, consultation process. I mean, when we had the meeting, there was. Um, so part of the consultation is to look at whether what is possible there. So there is. It's not a, a signed off deal at this point. It's part of a process that they would agree to fund if it was found to be viable and acceptable, and all of all of the boxes ticked. Through you, Mayor. Yes, indeed. And we will work with um, the department. Um, but um, our expectation, and we will confirm this as part of this application, and indeed the assurances that the department have given us is that the consultation is early, it is genuine, uh, it will be taken into account either in terms of whether the, the pop-up goes ahead and indeed in what form it goes ahead, whether it, the, it changes or whether indeed it stays the same. Um, and part of that, um, and Council will also uh, monitor the community feedback and keep councillors um, informed as to the community response for each of these. 
Thank you. Any other questions, councillors? If not, we have an officer's recommendation. Do I have a mover for this or something different? Councillor, uh, Councillor Copsey to move and Councillor Martin to second. Councillor Copsey. Thank you, Mayor. I'll just speak briefly at the start. This is very exciting to get to this point. Um, uh, the, the investment by the state government in uh, pop-up cycling infrastructure, which has sort of coincided with the period of the pandemic, has been very welcome. And I know that I have watched and I know a number of residents have watched quite enviously the progress of safe cycling infrastructure in some other municipalities. So I want to really thank the officers for the hard work that's gone into preparing this application. I think it's a fantastic opportunity for our city to actually get some runs on the board in getting some um, movement on safe cycling and safer roads for everybody uh, in a relatively um, uh, efficient way where we can actually test things as they go through. I acknowledge the uh, queries that have been raised through submissions tonight wanting to have a say on, on this and I'm very confident that um, we'll see a good process for that delivered through this opportunity as well. So I think it's a really great chance to move things forward. I uh, thank the officers and those who've already shown interest in these projects and um, I might leave it there and just wait to close. Thanks. Councillor Martin. As an avid cyclist who regularly uses most of the roads that are mentioned in these routes, I think any opportunity that's going to make cycling safe in the city of Port Phillip is a welcome initiative, particularly as we have this funded from the state government, and particularly as it seems it's going to have, as far as I can tell, minimal impact on most other forms of transport, parking and so on. I'm also greatly gratified to have the confirmation that there will be four resident consultations that there'll be a full resident consultation because I know that there is concern among some of our residents as to the impact of these and I, I welcome the consultation and hopefully the residents will be satisfied and if there are major concerns hopefully the Department of Transport will take on those concerns so we get a win-win outcome for everyone. Uh, Councillor Baxter did you want to speak? No I was, I was trying to second it. But yep, that's right. so. Would anyone else like to speak to the motion? Councillor Bond. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I won't be supporting this, so I don't think we've we've consulted enough with our residents. I've probably had eight to ten emails in the last um, four or five days from people who live in the general vicinity of St Kilda West, all saying, you know, we knew nothing about this. This is insufficient time for us um, to know about it. Um, and it's the same feedback mm -hmm. we get um, on many occasions when we when we go out to consult on our bike lanes. Um, I think we as right, a council... Mummy thinks that you have to... Oh, what did you do? Oh, someone's not on mute. Sorry, guys. Not sure who's that in the background. It's Adele. Adele. <laughs> I'm, I'm so oh, sorry. sorry. No, that's all good. Uh, Councillor Bonds, continue. So, mummy duty, super steep council duties. Um, I forgot where I was. Um, yeah, I think it's a lot of lot of a lot of the time. I think because we as a um, council are aware of something, we we think that yes, the community also knows, and perhaps, and I think the reaction I've got this week in the last few three or four days says that they they don't know that the, we've marked out some of these streets for bike lanes. Um, and I'd like to suggest that we we go through the Move Connect Live policy that we adopted a couple of years ago that had a, a, you know, a whole lot of these different bike lanes marked on our maps. And perhaps we write to everyone who's who's along these bike lanes just to let them know that we have this policy, this further information here, your street's been marked as a you know, future bike lane. Um, that way we can we cannot get um, this feedback from, from people saying you know, they don't know um, what it is we're, we're planning or what it is we've proposed or or what it is that may or may not happen in their particular area when we get to these um, these these particular locations, um, and, and it comes time to introduce things like this. We also fear that I don't think the Department of Transport will do a, as good a job um, in consulting with the community um, and listening to the community as as we would as a council, um, given 
you know, they're, they're not really as, as answerable to the to the community as we are. So I, I fear that you know handing this this consultation over to um, another organisation and just wiping our hands of it and saying, well, they'll do it, um, won't deliver the best result. And I had reason to be up in in East Melbourne recently trying to find a car park around around Victoria Parade is almost impossible because like every street up there's got a a new temporary um, bike lane on it it's it's just made it a very difficult area to visit and I sort of see why people eventually just say well I'm not going to go anywhere near that particular area because it's it's just been made so hard so when we do these things I think we need to get them right we also need to let people know what it is we we intend to do not just in, in and around St Kilda but across the whole municipality with all these um, lines on the map that we know about as councillors and we know about as council but I just don't think our community actually knows what it is that, that we've passed here. Uh, Councillor Consolo. Thank you. Uh, I do ride my bike in the areas of these many of the sections that we're discussing and I also drive my car there. I think the proposals are reasonable and will be an improvement. Uh, the resident consultations are very important because the local residents do have that first-hand knowledge of how these areas work across the, the day, the years, et cetera. So it's good to see that that will be happening. Uh, I actually did drive the section of um, from Kerford to Fitzroy Street today, and the entire way is for one block has a bike lane or bike markings the entire way. So when I asked my question earlier about what's going to physically change, it's really not. The only section didn't have markings on the road was on lock between Deacon and Mary. So it actually is physically there already. So there's not going to be a change on this one. So that St. Kilda West I, residents want to reassure them that it's already there. But the caller did make it, one of the callers made a really good point about around Cataroy Street and the traffic. And I think we do need to look some more there because it is a cul-de-sac uh, cul from Longmore that only bikes and pedestrians can come through at that across Cataroy. So it is a dangerous space if there's a lot of rat running, whatever it's called there, uh, that we need to address. And I think that that information needs to get pushed through during the community consultations to ensure that it's done. But the general routes sound like a good idea. So thank you. Uh, Councillor Sirikoff. Oh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, uh, well, I find the intent to apply to DOT for funding is a great thing to save money for the Council. I'm still concerned about how the content of the report has been presented on bike lanes and not really making clear where funding is to be finally targeted and why some streets have actually been included. The recommendation respects to Park Street and Moray Street and, and the Bay Trail, and yet um, there's mention of um, shimmy, shimmy bike paths in uh, St Kilda West. As we know, over the past few days, residents in St Kilda West have been contacting councillors after reading this report. This includes residents from West St Kilda Residents Association who are not aware of any community consultation on pop-up uh, bike lanes or these shimmy lanes on Longmore Street, York Street, and notably Cowdery Street. This is the residence group who have been in frequent communication with the council over the past seven years on local issues, such as the rat run traffic, uh, rat run traffic and high volumes of traffic on Cowdery Street. And we've got the statistics on how high the, those volumes are. And despite corner extensions and speed reductions, high volumes of tra traffic persists in, in the streets. And I don't believe a shimmy putt bike path will change anything, but only create more problems with this great thoroughfare of bringing more bikes through their back streets. Um, feedback from the residents is that it's, it's not a sensible way to spend uh, tax money, whether it be state or Victorian or local government, when there are other traffic issues in the streets. In June, in June of 2018, councillors Brand and Copsey presented a motion to resolve the traffic congestion in the minor streets of West St Kilda. The motion was carried unanimously. However, nothing to date has been done to resolve those traffic issues. And yet now a pop-up bike lane, which will in increase traffic, uh, is being proposed. 
we cannot dismiss what the residents are telling us just because the line has been drawn on a map. The DOC funding proposal is for, um, for pop-up bike lanes on such streets as Park Street and Moray Street. So I find it odd that this report includes details on shimmy bike paths outside the funding proposal and so indirectly commits council to other bike lanes and other streets with no community consultation. As well, I find it odd that the council wants to put shimmy bike paths on Hereford Road because the report says, and I quote, council officers understand that DOT has commenced initial design investigations of Hereford Road, which, it might in, which may involve a reduction in traffic lanes from two to one in each direction. Plus, council officers estimate that up to 10% of the 205, 250 of the parking spaces may be removed. I am not aware that any decisions on changes to Kerford Road have as yet been made with regard to the Shrine to Sea development. development. Council is looking at uh, temporary bike paths with no community consultation. This is now in the public domain and the community will be asking questions about why were we not consulted before this, this report was presented tonight. This seems to also apply to the G12 group and their concerns about Park Street East. Uh, because this report is not straightforward on what we are voting for, and until there are clear guidelines on what community engagement will do, take place by DOT at the, at the street level, not just by social media, I can't see that we can support this uh, our motion and it should be deferred uh, for better guidelines and clearer directions. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Hurl. Thanks, Madam Mayor. I don't think my microphone's working very well tonight. I'm trying to speak clearly as I possibly can, but give me a bit of a sound check on that. That'd be great. Uh, I'm going to vote for this proposal. I, I, I fully take on board what Councillor Bond and particularly Councillor Sirikoff have just said, and I share many of their concerns, particularly around what I call the shrine to nowhere, based on the fact that this project has been going for years and we still don't have a, a roadmap, a plan, uh, a, a schedule of works or anything about what that project actually is. And in many respects, it's a case study about uh, poor government policy because the, the bureaucrats have been basing their assumptions and work such as this based on a press release, not actually a policy statement in terms of what's actually meant to be happening with that. So um, I, don't, I don't really, I don't really understand everything to do with Kerford Road or Albert Road gets bolted in with the Shrine to the Sea, um, as this has as well, which again, there's no real policy direction around what that project is. Is it a road project? Is it a historical project? As it was originally canvassed by the person that came up with the idea. The reason I'm voting for this is I, I want um, Route K to advance. I think this is the best solution for what I call the bike super highway, which is the Kilda Road, to divert down um, in what I think will be a pretty pleasant uh, experience for the bike rider through um, the edges of the golf course there behind the school and then a gentle merge down onto Albert Road. Uh, the traffic uh, sewer that is um, Kingsway in that area uh, has really very few options in terms of safe passage and safe crossing and Route K allows the most narrow point of that crossing uh, to be the bike crossing. So, uh, and I don't think Albert Road is the best place for that to occur. The other concern, which is a bit weird because I'm voting for this item, is uh, what Councillor Sirikoff was referring to in terms of Park Street. We have to be very careful about what's happening on the other side of Park Street based on the proposal here, uh, and we need to get that right. We've got you know, 8,000 odd residents moving into that street on, I think there's not 17, 18, 19 approved developments on that strip. Um, reducing the footpath size, et cetera, has a, a very, you know, a lasting impact for many, many decades. Yes, we need to have accessible transport, uh, but that street has already lacked um, any form of long-term planning, particularly where the state government decided to put the tram stop, regardless of this council's great advocacy work to inform them that that was the wrong decision and it was proved to be the wrong decision pretty quickly. Uh, and now they're scrambling to fix it up with our support. 
but we, we need to be very careful about where where those routes go when there's competing uh, items such as what Council Sirikop was talking about, about around car parks, but also the future community that are going to live on these streets and the future um, traders that could trade on those areas. But generally speaking, Route K, I think, is, is something that should be supported. Also take into account Councillor Consolo's comments about many of the streets uh, away from the ward I represent uh, already have existing markings, etc. So uh, a lot of the uh, mapping uh, routes on the map in attachment two probably won't come to full full fruition over this, but there always already is a fair bit of existing infrastructure in most of these areas, other than Route K. So hopefully this um, this program allows Route K to uh, be spearheaded and go ahead. That's uh, that's why I'm uh, eager to vote for this proposal. But uh, very much a big thank you to the officers as always for putting um, what is a pretty clear report together. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what actually occurs out of this um, decision here this evening. Thanks, Madam Anyone else would like to speak to the motion? I will briefly speak uh, to the motion. I will be supporting this motion um, for a number of things. I think the pop-up words has got lost in um, and actually uh, has obscured the actual fundamental of the shimmy routes, which is to make it safer and point out where there already are bikes travelling um, and to for both cyclists and cars to make it safe, uh, safer for um, people that already travel in those uh, those areas. Um, there's a couple of reasons I'll be funding, uh, not funding it, supporting it. We actually had a meeting with Department of Transport exactly around this and, and they talked us through the difficulty and they understand around in inner city areas, putting in pop-up bike routes of any description uh, is a challenging um, process and that they are very, um, they're, getting, they're getting more skilled with community engagement and they look forward to working with our community and with council officers, they told us that. And in that meeting, they were very open to hearing from residents and looking for good um, ways to support our community to move around differently, which we know. And if there's extra cars going down Cowderoy and all that, we actually want more people to get off their, get out of their cars and get on their bikes. And by doing that, we need to look at opportunities for these kind of pop-up bike um, paths um, or, or, or separated bike paths in the long term. And the best way to do it is to engage with our community. And uh, we have... Um, at this point not had the funding uh, or uh, the opportunity to do so on every route and here's an opportunity to apply to the government with no guarantee apply to get the government state government to fund some of these six-week consultations which is probably longer than we would be able to fund ourselves in consultation with councillors and officers so i think it's a, an amazing opportunity uh, especially when uh, often we hear that we don't want to spend ratepayers money unnecessarily well here's an opportunity to um to find some funding that's out there, trying to improve communities moving around and, and to apply to see if we can, one, get our community consultation funded, but also provide safer uh, ways for our community to travel around on bicycle. So I, I'm kind of surprised that um, we're not jumping at the opportunity to apply and then actually hear from our community in full, uh, knowing that um, these things are necessary to make our community safer for both as cyclists and, and, our, um, and bike riders. Uh, and so look, I will be very much in support of it. I think, I think we need to heed some of the ratepayers that spoke earlier tonight about where we should put our money and here's an opportunity to, re you know, to um, find money from another source and, and to consult with our community. So I think there's two win-wins and if we can in the long run make our community safer, I think this is a, a very important motion to support. Uh, Councillor Clark. Thanks, Madam Mayor. Um, I don't think these, I don't share the, the general views that these things are, are necessary. Um, I think they're an option uh, for the community. And I have to say, one of the things that I do admire about council and council processes is the strong commitment to consultation and engagement with the community. Uh, through being a councillor in recent months, I've seen the levels that the council goes to engage and I've been pleasantly surprised and, and as I said, admire the lengths and breadths that we go to to allow everyone to have their say and that their feedback is taken into consideration. Um, it, it's this commitment to our community which is totally missing from this proposal and not only is it missing, it's never happened. And the proposal from the Department of Transport that 
uh, for consultation, which doesn't seem to have got much conversation uh, through this discussion, is that it's only for six weeks. Um, I'm yet to hear of many council processes or consultations that only go for six weeks. For many of the residents, this is the first time they've heard about a shimmy bike lane, removing one traffic lane from Park Street, taking out 13 car parks on Park Street, or losing potentially 25 car parks on Kirkwood Road. Um, as I mentioned before, the council's own recommendation says it seeks a commitment from the Department of Transport that for proposals funded by the program, a process of design, community engagement, evaluation, adjustment and maintenance will be implemented over the life of these trial pop-up bike lanes. The council also looks forward to receiving a response from the Department of Transport to the council's request and the opportunity for council officers to contribute local knowledge and technical expertise in the design of the proposals. So from that, we are not yet guaranteed input into the design engagement or to provide the technical input that the council officers obviously have. Yet we expect the community to accept this proposal from the department that it seeks to impose on our community. We don't even know all the impacts on the municipalities' roads. Uh, we sit in this meeting making decisions on behalf of our community without even knowing what they want. Um, I, I do not believe you can rely on a six week consultation process that we don't even know what that process looks like. Um, it's a poor process that uh, is being discussed and it should be rejected purely on the basis that our community deserves a level of engagement and consultation uh, that's consistent with how council would go about it to the level that council would go about it before the state government imposes this on our community. And for those reasons, I will not be supporting this proposal. Are there any more people to speak to the motion? If not, I'll return to Councillor Copsey to close. Thank you very much, Mayor. Um, well, just to speak to a few of the things that have been raised, I do find it a little bit disappointing um, to hear when we've had some discussion this evening around the fact that consultation is going to proceed, um, continual references to the fact that there's not enough consultation or no consultation. Having served on council in the past, I know we do different levels of consultation for different projects, but um, the idea that six weeks is an insufficient time, I just don't think holds water. We regularly consult on major strategies and so on with a period of four weeks. So I think this is going to be a great opportunity um, to hear all those opinions, and there will be many, um, making, making our streets safer, particularly in an area like Port Phillip, where we have a growing population and we have an existing problem with traffic congestion. We have existing problems absolutely with road safety. I think something that really often gets lost in these conversations is that, uh, and I don't like to harp on it too much because I think, um, you know, you can come off really, you know, sort of bleeding hard or something, but literally people are risking their health and safety when we go out on bikes in our city sometimes. I've had lots of near miss experiences, in fact, on some of the routes that are um, discussed in the pro proposal tonight. And it's just not really acceptable that we keep pushing things out into the never never. This is a fantastic opportunity for us to work in collaboration with another level of government uh, to deliver safer roads for everybody in our city. I think that it's um, going to be a great opportunity for us to have those conversations, but I do think that there needs to be a level of perspective as well around the fact that there is an un unsafe level um, for a cyclist in our city. And it's something that we've said as a council that we're going to address. Uh, and it, in fact, we need to really be looking for every opportunity that we can at this stage to make sure that all active transport is supported in our city. We've come through it. Uh, well, we haven't come through it. We're still going through a really seismic event that's changed how our city moves around uh, and it's changed people's travel patterns. And in particular, uh, one of the things that we know in Port Phillip is that we have historically had really fantastic levels of public transport use by our community. And due to COVID pressures and changes in the way that people move around, unfortunately, I think that that's going to be something that we'll see return over time, but more slowly. And so steps that we can take right now while people are already going through changes in their behaviour 
to make sure that the great uptake of cycling that our city already enjoys. We have some of the highest levels of participation in Ride to School Day, for example, in the state. And that's fantastic. And it's the sort of thing that we need to encourage more. What our end of the bargain is in that scenario as council is making sure that people who want to take the option to take up active and sustainable transport options have the infrastructure that supports them to do so safely. And it's a, it is a real issue for, you know, like I'm a, com I'm a confident cyclist, I'll go on a, a route, whether, you know, the bike lane is painted there or not, but not everybody is in that situation. And particularly for people who want to try cycling, but might be um, feeling more intimidated, this is something really practical that we can do to help. So it's the start of a conversation here. It's the start of an application process. I'm really pleased that we've got this opportunity. Um, and I know that we'll have a good conversation through this, but I just wanted to add that perspective in as well. Um, I think that it can't be overstated that we've got a responsibility here around safety. And we know that with the congestion as it is, we need more people to be embracing active and sustainable transport options. And that can be a beautiful thing in our city. We have one of the most beautiful places to ride a bike in the state. What with our beautiful foreshore, our lovely leafy shaded tre streets, um, it's a beautiful place to ride a bike. I want it to be one of the safest as well. And I want our streets to be safer for everybody who's using them. So I'm very, very pleased to support this motion tonight. And I wish the officers all the very best with the application. I look forward to the conversation that's to come. All right, let's put that to the vote. Uh, Councillor Clark. Against. Councillor Copsey. Four. Councillor Crawford. Four. Councillor Consolo. Four. Councillor Martin. Four. Councillor Pearl. In favour. Councillor Sirikoff. Against. Councillor Baxter. Four. Councillor Bond. Against. The motion is carried. Councillors, I'm proposing that we take a 10 minute break now because- Could I just uh, request, oh, everything's taken by division, isn't it? It is by division, yes. Thank you. <laughs> I forget that too. All right, councillors, we're gonna take a 10 minute uh, break. So I expect you back here or hope to see you back here at 8.30 and we'll continue then. All right, everyone, welcome back. Uh, we're now moving to item 10.3, which is the report, the St Kilda Marina Project, the Community Engagement Outcomes. Councillors, do we have any questions to the officers on this report? No questions. If not, we have an officer's recommendation. Do I have a move of this or something different? Do I have a mover? And a seconder, Councillor Copsey uh, to move in Councillor Baxter to second. Councillor Copsey. I'll reserve, thank you. Councillor uh, Baxter. No, thanks, Madam Mayor. Would anyone else like to speak to the motion? Anyone else like to speak to the motion? I'll briefly speak. Uh, look, it's exciting to get to this next stage of the process. And I think some of the recommendations that have come out of our community consultation, uh, like the shade and, and programming your community events and all uh, and art projects is a, a real opportunity for um, to feed into the process. So I look forward to what comes next in the design phase. Would anyone else like to speak to the motion? Councillor Copsey to close. Basically said what I was going to, Mayor. Um, it's been a fantastic journey that we've been on with the Marina Project. Um, I know that not everybody saw what, everything that they wanted uh, in the final outcomes for the project, but I think that there's been a real sense of um, optimism and opportunity created around the site. And certainly coming through this, final, uh, this community engagement report with some really strong themes. Um, consistent with a lot of what came through in the community panel as well around the opportunity to increase uh, vegetation, greening and native vegetation through the site. The art um, themes was a really interesting thing to come through this as well. So thank you everybody who participated and I'm happy to support the acceptance and release of the report. Great, so let's put that to the vote under division. Uh, Councillor Copsey. Four. Councillor Crawford. Four. Councillor Consolo. Four. Councillor Martin. Four. Councillor Pearl. Five. 
Councillor Sirikov. Four. Councillor Baxter. Four. Councillor Bond. Four. Councillor Clark. Four. That motion is carried. Moving on to 11.1, .1, which is the Community Electric Vehicle Charging Permit. Councillors, do we have any questions uh, for the officers in regards to this report? Uh, uh, Councillor Pearl. Thanks, Madam Mayor. Just wondering if officers can provide more background around the timing of the two-year trial um, and uh, what what would be the potential impact if that uh, if that was reduced in terms of its time to say six months? Catherine Pound. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'm actually going to pass over to Zoe Amani, who's the coordinator of sustainable policies. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Zoe. Uh, through you, Mayor. Um, the proposed two-year time frame is really because um, because of the level of investment that's required from community members to purchase and install the chargers. And um, so that's somewhere in the region of, of four to five thousand uh, dollars, which is which is not an insignificant in investment for many people. Um, and we believe that the two year time frame was appropriate to, to make that investment uh, reasonable. Um, the, the report actually recommends that we that officers report back to council after 12 months um, mid, mid trial and to see whether uh, the trial will continue or, or to make other rec recommendations to council about any policy positions on this matter. Um, another reason for the, that, that 12 months is because although we would do our best to ensure that, that the permit application process is as quick and easy as possible for community members and applicants, um, there are additional approvals required from external parties and there, there's a possibility that might that might hold up the time between when an application is is put in and when it's approved and when the infrastructure is actually installed and operational for the length of time required to make an assessment and a recommendation back to council. Madam Mayor, if I could just ask a follow up, uh, if I may. Yes. The so what, what's your expected um, what's your expected timeline? In terms of permit, how long do you think it will take from permit application to installation? Obviously, you don't control the installation component, but what's your estimation in terms of, uh, let's say, me submitting an application to um, me getting one out the front of my house? How long do you think that will take? And what's the, well, how long will the bit you control take in terms of the permitting process? Is that Zoe again? Through you, Mayor. Yes, I can answer that one. Um, uh, at my best guess, having you know, as as Mr. Walker had indicated, this this permit has not been done uh, before by anyone that we know of, so it's it's a little difficult to say. And because of those third party approvals, it might you know it, it is quite difficult. My best guess at this time would be maybe two to three months between if if council uh, support this recommendation tonight and. Uh, that the infrastructure might be installed, but uh, as I say, it's, it's that's just my my guess at this point. Um, and and uh, you know, if I can add to that, uh, it's likely that that you know that that could become a more streamlined process into the future. But if we're talking about these first first round of permits, that that's those are my thoughts at the moment. Is that fine, Councillor Pearl? Does that answer your where you're yeah, at? Thank you very much, Madam Mayor. Uh, Councillor Bond. Um, my concern with this proposal is that if a resident were to spend a couple of thousand dollars um, on having a charging point installed in the in the nature strip out the front of their house, that they would um, develop some sense of entitlement or perception that that perhaps that car spot out the front of their house is is theirs. Um, what safeguards do we have in place or protocols or conditions on the license is probably the best way to describe it, to ensure that um, whilst once a resident spends the money and installs the um, charging point out the front of their house, they're, they're fully aware that there is no um, sole use or um, even 
majority time use of that spot, it is still a, an on-street parking spot in the city of Port Phillip, whereby anyone with an entitlement to park in that street or in that location is able to park and there's no um, exclusive use of these spaces and we're not creating exclusive car parks for, for, for electric vehicles on our streets here. Uh, is that Catherine or Zoe? Uh, so you may, or I can answer that one again. Um, it's very clear in the guidelines that the, the permit does not uh, give any additional rights to, to parking and we're not changing any parking restrictions and that that spot is not the, um, the, the right of the permit holder. Um, that would also be put as a condition on the permit and be made clear to any applicants through the process from the very beginning. So the first step of the application process, as noted in the guidelines, is that they would contact a council officer before putting in any application for a permit, and we would very clearly explain that to them at that stage and through other stages throughout. The evaluation criteria of the trial will also look at the feedback from others, not just the permit holders, so that's an opportunity for uh, neighbouring property uh, residents and, and community members to give their feedback to us through that as well. Uh, Councillor, sorry, I'm going down to Councillor Martin. Thank you, Mayor. In public question time, one of the speakers questioned why, if this is such a wonderful thing, that, that, that it's such a wonderful opportunity, why are only five people being given the opportunity to do it? And I may know the answer, but I see confirmation from council officers. Is this because the provider is going to provide these five services for free for the trial? And my understanding is, is there the potential that if the trial is successful, the first five applicants would then be able to purchase the product for half price? Is this the reason why we're only offering five trials in the first place? Uh, Zoe or Catherine? Through you, Mayor. Uh, the five was actually uh, not related to that offer that Mr. Walker made earlier. Uh, it was just that we considered that an appropriate number, given that this hasn't been done anywhere before um, and that we haven't had the opportunity to learn from any other area. So we thought that five would be a good number to test in different property types, different locations, different, you know, one, one in a nature strip, one in a footpath, and, and just to use that uh, information that we gather from those to inform what we do next. Uh, Councillor Sirikoff. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I'm just wondering, um, can Council provide details on the criteria or measurements for this uh, trial to be a success or a failure? Zoe? Through you, Mayor. Yes, um, the report indicates a number of considerations that will be taken into account in the evaluation of the trial. So that includes feedback from the permit applicants through a structured survey, feedback from other community members within close proximity of those trial locations, um, feedback from councillors, council officers and their contractors uh, and that is, is primarily to, to look at um, to consider any impacts that that has to any council service delivery so that could include maintenance or, or enforcement and, and, and services that we deliver like that. Um, we'll also consider the council officer time involved in administering the permit process uh, that which would inform the fees as well that we would charge. We look at the estimated carbon emission reductions as a result of the trial, which would be provided uh, through information provided by the permit holder. We'll look at the number of requests that are made to participate in the trial and the level of interest from our community. And we'll also look at the, the number and the nature of any feedback or complaints that are received about the uh, process or the infrastructure itself. Is it also, is there a um, potential for like for a maximum number of these uh, charging points in a street? Maybe that's maybe too looking too far ahead. 
through uh, you, Matt. Uh, through you, Matt. Um, I think that, yeah, the, we don't have an idea of that at this time. Uh, it, there could be a time in the future that we may need to set some sort of, of limits like that, but it is based on property frontage. So uh, I don't really see an issue with that. It would really be um, you know, the number of, of properties that, that would have an appropriate spot and don't have off street parking. Thank um, you. Councillor Clark. Yes, uh, thanks, Madam Mayor. Um, mine is a simple question. I think I have misunderstood something, but I just wanted a clarification that I note the um, the permits or the charges are bought for two years. And I note that at the end of the first 12 months, uh, it's coming back to council and doing a review. I can't see anywhere where it confirms how long the trial is for. Is it assumed the trial is for two years in line with the purchase of the, um, the charges? Sorry? Through you, Mayor. Um, yes, yeah, so the trial would be for um, un until December 2023, which would be the maximum uh, expiry date of a permit. So it is it is a little complicated, I, I grant you that. Um, but uh, it, it was really because, as, as I said earlier, there is a level of investment well, upfront required, and we think we'll probably get up to five in the in the next few months and issue a two-year permit. Um, but we would definitely, as, as the recommendation states, report back to Council after 12 months to, to determine um, the progress so far and, and whether other permits may, you know, to recommend whether other permits might be issued. Could I just ask a follow up, please? So sure. if, if it's determined for some perhaps unexpected reason the trial shouldn't continue, what happens for the remaining 12 months for the people who've purchased? The, the charges. Sorry? Through you, Mayor. Um, if there are no breaches of a permit or, or safety issues or anything like that, the, the permits would continue to their expiry date. Uh, if um, it, It's quite clearly stated in the guidelines and on the permits that if there are safety issues or, or breaches of breaches of the permit conditions that the infrastructure would be removed and returned, the infrastructure would be returned to the applicant and council would hold hold a bond uh, to, to cover the cost of, of any cost incurred to us to do that. And, and would the person get their money back then for the half of the trial that doesn't proceed? If, if it was considered a breach of, of of permit conditions, I think that would need to be considered on a on a case by case basis. It wouldn't necessarily be guaranteed that a, an applicant would get their money back if they were the one that breached the oh, okay. permit conditions. But I may need to to check with our local laws officers about the common practice around that. Thank you, uh, Councillor Pearl. Well, I to Marcus, we oh sorry, Councillor Pearl, we can't hear you. Is this a bit better? Yes, thank you. So I guess I'm slightly foreshadowing something here, but what I'm perhaps suggesting is is the t December 2023 end date. Um, by the time you get this set up and it's advertised and permits get put in place, that's actually not a very long period of time from the way that this thing moves along. So, um, yeah, I'm not asking a question here, am I? I guess I'm thinking out loud, no. but my, my thought my thought is that uh, the question is to the officers: What would be the effect of uh, pushing the date from 23 to 24, and then perhaps tightening up, as in we we issue trial per, as in the trial takes place for 12 months, then it's reviewed, but the permits would be issued for up to three years, um, and then at the 12 month 12 month point, we may not we may end the trial and then issue no further permits. Uh, if that was worked in the appropriate amendment, would that be a workable scenario? So effectively, we have a 12 month trial where we issue three year permits. Uh, Zoe? Through you, Mayor. Um, the, the two year time frame was chosen because um, based on a, a household with two cars, that would give a, 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 a payback period for the investment that was that the community members had, had outlaid at the beginning. Um, compared to what they would pay for a, a 
fuel for a, a regular uh, diesel or petrol car. Um, extending that to three years um, could have the benefit of attracting more applicants. Uh, it would also, um, in, in relation to, to uh, the, the previous question, it, it could have the risk of if the infrastructure was inconvenient um, or, or not really well liked by others in the vicinity, uh, but not necessarily breaching any permit conditions, we would just, it would be there for longer. That's really the only impact of, uh, negative impact I could see of, of having a three year permit. We might go to Peter Smith to. But three, Mayor, if I may assist in answering Councillor Bell's question, one option Councillor Bell would be to commence the trial from the date of the installation of the first permit, two years or three years. That would then take out the application time. That might be another alternative that you may consider if you're considering an amendment. I think just to answer the previous questions, Madam Mayor, and, I, and, and Zoe might clarify, the 12 month review, so that the permits will be issued for two years as currently proposed or longer if somebody amends that. 12 month review uh, would be probably not to stop the trial unless there was serious uh, risks or issues emerging, um, but to report back to council as I understand it on uh, whether the trial should be extended to more, to more applicants um, that were being successful. There may be a decision at that point to stop it if the trial is totally unsuccessful in the first 12 months. But I think it's really to give council more options. But any, as, as Zoe said, any permit, as I understand it, that's issued would be for two years and extend until the end of that two years. Um, so I hope that clarifies council and gives you another option. Yeah, thank you. So, so if I may, Madam Mayor, so what you're suggesting is we, we alter 3.2, it was the wonderful of WebEx to stay at the uh, uh, conclusion of construction or installation. So what you're suggesting the permit would commence at the... The, the uh, trial would, the, the two years, would the two-year trial would commence when the first unit is installed. That takes out the application period. Because so. the way the motions members are uh, worded, as I may, if I may, Madam Mayor, uh, through you, is it's not a two year trial per se, it just expires on the 31st of December 2023. Yeah, I might ask Zoe to comment on my comment because, um, Zoe, do you want to just add to this? But I was trying to, I guess I was trying to take out the permit application time so that they got a full two years. Um, and so it would be with these permits to expire no later than 31st December 2023 or two years from the date of first installation, whichever is the latest, is the later. It's probably the amendment you make. Okay. Council Pearl, is that, can you consider that while we may? Yeah, thank you. And I'll push that off. I'm very seriously considering putting that forward. So if the officers could type that up, that'd be awesome. Okay. I'm. All right. Um, uh, Councillor Surikoff, you've got to see, do you, is it a question? Because a comment, it's not time for comment now. Is it a question that you're willing to ask? Yes, yeah, sorry, it is a question. I put in the okay. wrong letter. Okay. Um, oh, I've just been waiting too long. I've lost my track of thought now. Um, we can come oh, back yeah, to you. I, yep. I recall now. So um, can uh, Council please clarify um, so with the trial of five electric charging points, um, I thought these were free to the um, those who were applying. Those five five homes who were applying for it, there was not was no charge during the trial period of five thousand dollars or that that four to five thousand uh, dollars. Through you, Mayor. Uh, the the proposal is for the applicants to cover the cost of, of procuring and installing the infrastructure, which is likely to be, depending on where it is, likely to be in the region of, of four and five thousand dollars, depending on what kind of works are required. Um, it's also proposed to, to charge a, uh, a fee for those permits. So an, an initial application fee for 124 
$5 with an annual renewal fee of $100 per year. Uh, on, but no, during the trial period? Can I, can I clarify that? It's dependent on the applicant who they're do, who's are putting the infrastructure in. It's nothing to do with council, the cost, the free parts. Yeah, so I, I thought the uh, company who was supplying the EV charging points was going to supply for free um, the installation and the product itself. So Kylie Bennett is going to clarify, but through, through you, Mayor, I think Council, for the purposes of deciding whether to issue a permit or not, um, needs to, so Council wouldn't be involved in any commercial discussions or negotiations that uh, a, a resident might have with any provider. Um, so uh, what officers have done is put forward a, a recommendation based on the average cost um, and, and given the average cost and, and the investment that council, um, or sorry, that a resident may need to make, the, a reasonable return on that investment in terms of setting the required permit. Um, the reason we've done that is that um, we don't think it's appropriate for us to get into sort of individual negotiations that residents might have with providers. And if that negotiation changed, we wouldn't want that to be a, a, a risk to council, which is why we've we've looked at it in terms of the, the cost that if someone was to pay the full cost, um, making sure that they, they're getting a, a reasonable return on their investment, both in a financial but also an environmental uh, perspective. Uh, Councillor Consolo. Thank you. I have two questions. The first one is actually clarifying what we we're just talking about there. My understanding that there's two costs essentially for this. If you were starting out, you the the resident would need to buy the battery that charges, and then there's the cost that is the connection that we're talking about for this permit tonight. So that would be what would be covered by the the um, curb charge company. Is that correct? I think I think as Carly um, in. Indicated a lot of that is to do with the commercial element, is it not, Kelly? Through through you, Mayor. So um, there's a cost uh, in terms of purchasing the the charging um, uh, the, the charger, but also the installation um, uh, costs as well. And that wouldn't be something that council or council officers were party to. So that but that would be potentially a cost to the resident, dependent upon what arrangement they may strike with a third party provider. Uh, there's also a cost uh, in terms of uh, a permit cost to council um, and, and that was uh, proposed through the council plan and budget process so that there was a legal basis by which to charge that in the event that council uh, wish to issue a permit um, at this time or sometime into the future. So they, you're, you're right in that there are two costs, uh, but there's only one cost as it relates to council, the, the permit fees uh, and the bonds, to, uh, a bond to cover uh, any potential damage to uh, the public realm that hopefully won't occur, but in the unfortunate event that it did, um, there, there's a bond uh, there to cover to cover that cost. Thank you. Um, my, okay, the other question I had sort of relates to this, but my concern is that we're dragging this out uh, before more people have the opportunity. And I think I've heard that there's about 27 people who've indicated interest in this. So if we're only talking about five people and the reason stated earlier today was saying that um, because that just seems like a good number. Could we increase that number if we are going to make it, if it stays at two years or any amendments instead of just five? Uh, Zoe? Through you, Mayor. Mayor? Um, yes, Council could, could choose to increase that number. Um, the, you know, the, as, as I stated earlier, the, the only risk that I could foresee would be um, that we would have in, uh, infrastructure in our public realm that, that we may not want or may, may be contentious, but uh, um, it, it, it's quite a small risk. And the follow-up is, was there a number given by the, um, the curb charge that they'd be willing to take the trial up to, to cover the cost? Zoe? 
through you, Mayor. Uh, I, I believe that the the number stated uh, by Mr. Walker earlier was was that he he would be be willing to negotiate with with directly with community members to to uh, provide some infrastructure for up to five. Um, but um, regardless of of that uh, negotiation, um, it could uh, you know we could increase that number if other community members were willing to pay for it or if they could come to some other arrangement. Um, Councillor Clark. I think this is a question, but it feels like we're negotiating uh, or stepping into the commercial realms of the negotiation around this sort of from what the um, company may be prepared to provide and what community and what that price may be subject to how many we may so I'm just not sure you know, we can move an amendment to the motion or request more information or expand it potentially on the motion but, but um, you know, subject to that I would have thought that uh, council officers would need to re-engage with the company to ensure that that is something that they can provide. So can I just interrupt Councillor Clark? Is it just me or is your internet really terrible? It's really terrible. So Councillor Clark, we can barely understand you Councillor Clark. So I think I'm just going to clarify. Um, so um, the question was around, we can't really amend it at this point around any negotiations beyond five without for the discussion, yeah. so just just clarifying, it might not be appropriate. If that's the question with um, Kali is or Zoe. Uh, Are you mayor? Uh, it it wasn't the officer's intention to to be engaged with any commercial negotiations between the any individual no, provider I'm, and a community sorry, member. Can you hear me? Councillor Clark, I'm just getting an answer, but I'm you just are being. Can you hear me? Not properly. Yes. No, we can't. You keep can cutting you out. No, sorry, you'll have to. Sorry, Zoe. Could you just repeat that? It probably Better? at this point, Councillor Clark, you might need to log on somehow other okay. way. So I'm going to I'm going to round back because we can't actually understand you enough there, Councillor Clark, to really continue that line of questioning unless you want to type it into the um, the chat and someone else can ask it on your behalf perhaps okay councillors we have any do we have any other questions okay so uh, so um, unfortunately, Councillor Pearl, I already had indicated to councillors that I would be bringing an amended, uh, an alternative recommendation. Um, so you'll, well, I, I am going to go with my amendment uh, and, and then if you would wish to amend that, uh, my alt rec. So um, could, could I pop that on the screen, please? Um, and I'll read out the parts that uh, so it's endorsing a trial of a curb charging payment for residents and businesses with no off-street parking to install electric vehicle chargers on council land. And then 3.2 would um, remove it, remove the time frame of the 31st of December and say on a rolling six month basis up to a maximum permit period of the 31st of December, 2023. And at the conclusion of the first six months, the CEO will arrange for the review of the progress of the trial and report back to council at the earliest possible opportunity to help shape future policy in this direction and I think there was another and then in 3.3 .3, um, this is to allow the CEO to make alter uh, minor amendments including reflecting any changes required as a result of this council resolution prior to publishing them. Do I have a seconder for this motion? Councillor Martin, thank you. Um, so uh, look, I think this is a very exciting uh, moment in time when uh, we can lead the way and, and Port Phillip does like to be the ones that lead the way in many aspects. And I know that our community is, is eager to up, uh, take up EVs. 
uh, as, a, as a notion in our municipality. And I think this could be the first step to making that possible, especially when many of our properties do not have off street parking. I am bringing the alternative motion in this uh, and seeking your support in that um, I think a two year trial does not allow uh, further people to uptake it, if, especially if it is successful. And I think the six month basis allows for the permit to be applied for, get the other uh, approvals and then installation and get feedback from the community around. Um, and then obviously at the six month point, when we get a report back, we can confirm that all is going well and perhaps at that point also decide to open it up to other um, residents to also be a part of the, um, well, not trial, but ongoing process then. Um, so it really is about bringing this into line with addressing the climate emergency, looking at the keenness of our community, um, and especially given uh, the knowledge that we have around the, uh, for the first five anyway, there isn't a cost as upfront cost uh, to them. So the payback period isn't initial in this uh, early stages for these, um, the people that will participate in this trial. So I am asking you to support this so that we can get this on the road uh, and see if this can be the first in Australia to make a huge difference for inner city councils around the country. Councillor Martin. Yeah, I'm very excited that we have at least one provider who's offering this opportunity to the local residents to uh, sign up for a curb charging uh, station. I'm also really gratified that we've heard in public uh, speaking time that we've got well over 20 local residents who'd like to be part of this. And while I well understand that um, at the moment we're only aware of one provider and in the initial discussion with the council officers, we're putting up five and I'm quite happy to leave this at five at the moment, as you've indicated, Madam Mayor, at the end of the six month review, if there are other providers out there or the existing providers prepared to provide more um, units, we may well want to increase the number from five to 10 to 20, who knows what, but just to get the process underway, just to get something started, just so we can at least get to the first six month review and see whether or not this is gonna be a viable program. And I sincerely hope that it will be. I, I think we need to, to move with this with as much speed as possible. If we support this motion tonight, we can perhaps have things underway within the next two or three months. We may even have up to five people with curb charging permits before Christmas. That would give us to the middle of next year for our first review. And we may be able to increase the program to 10, 20 or who knows what, but we need to get the program underway now. If we pass this motion, support this motion tonight, hopefully we'll have at least five residents able to charge their cars at the curbside by Christmas. We'll then need to uh, review that at six months time and we'll take it from there. I note that people like Councillor Bond have made some very, very relevant points and we'll need to work with our council officers to make sure that the documentation is correct. I'd be very concerned if someone thought that they had, because they had a curb charging permit, it gave them the right to park in that space. We'll need to be very, very clear with the documentation we provide so that people know exactly what they're signing up to. But I urge you all to support this. I think it's a fantastic initiative. We are leaders in Australia, as we always are in the city of Port Phillip. Uh, Councillor Pearl. Thanks, Madam Mayor. Just move a minor amendment, if I may. Uh, 3.2, instead of five, change it to 10. As in properties? Yeah, just change the word five to 10. Not sure I've got a second up, so. Do we have, a, is that the, the full length of the amendment, Councillor Pearl? Yeah, look, well, that's it. Yep, uh, we've got a second for Councillor Consolo. Councillor Pearl, would you speak to your amendment? I don't fully agree with the way the amendment's been, the amended old motion's been put um, in terms of, a, I'll talk to that in a moment, but I think the way the CEO suggested we do it was better in the, the I get what you're getting at with a rolling six months, but there's still an end date here on December 31, 2023, which means uh, I don't necessarily fully share Councillor Martin's optimism about getting these in by Christmas because I know how long permitting process work when you've got multiple agencies in place. So I was going to move the motion that had changed the 10 and also changed the 2024 to uh, 2023 is 2024, albeit I think the, the wording the CEO's it's probably, probably was better. But that's beside the point. I just, I'll, I'll settle on the 10. The reason being is these things are expensive. I don't think the payback period is going to work for most people, 
But let's face it, most people that have electric cars at the moment aren't, aren't most people, they're the one percenters. Um, the only people that can afford to drive around in a Tesla, which is you know, that sort of uh, that sort of price range at the moment, have um, probably have the money and the will to be able to throw at this sort of initiative. So, uh, albeit their payback probably won't work on an economical basis based on the parameters that have been put in the alt motion, I'm pretty confident there'll be ten people out there that are willing to fork out um, the five to probably upwards of ten thousand dollars to install the on the streets to facilitate what effectively is a permit trial. So I think five is such a small number, even 10 is such a small number. Um, once we come back and have this six month rolling review, I suspect that'll be increased as well. But um, let's just see how, how this works. You, there's apparently a, a commercial party that's interested in providing five, then I'm sure they can find another five to work it out. So the bigger the sample size, the better. Great, uh, Councillor Consolo. Thank you, I also agree we should increase to the 10. Uh, it might not get taken up, but it gives that opportunity. Uh, we, if the list is already at 27, people will have to gauge if this short term idea is worth the money now. But I also am looking forward to the trial being shorter overall. Should this be successful, we can roll this out as people do want it. Uh, would anyone else like to speak to the amendment? I think uh, Councillor Copsey, you've got a question? Yes, a clarifying oh. question on the function of the amendment, if I could. Uh, I'm just seeking some confirmation. I, I, my reading of this, if officers can either confirm or deny, is um, because it's worded up to 10 properties, my only concern is if we um, put in something put something in place that an applicant can't satisfy that, that, that a provider can't satisfy however i think that because it's worded up to 10 if there's some issue around logistics or supply or cap capacity then we could go with a lower number during the trial period i'm just wondering if officers can confirm if i'm correct you know, on that reading who do we want to go to uh yes. Zoe? Yeah, I can answer that, Kylie. Um, Kylie. Yeah, through you, through you, Mayor, I I believe that you know up to ten properties, um, you know, gives uh, officers the ability if there were eight properties or residents looking to um, participate, that would be fine. Um, we could certainly permit that. Uh, if there was twelve, uh, we'd only be able to go up to ten uh, until we uh, hit the the six month review point and that would be part of what we would bring back to council through the review point. If we were oversubscribed, we would uh, advise you of that and you could decide accordingly what you wished officers to do. Does that clarify Councillor Copsey? Yes. All right. Uh, Councillor Sirikoff, you're speaking to the amendment. Uh, yeah, I just, um, I think that um, having up to 10 properties is the way to go to have a, a better sample size of across the community um, for any um, positives or negatives that uh, we might need to gather. Um, I just think that having a um, charging point at your doorstep is a, a more attractive reason for purchasing a, an electric vehicle because of the convenience of charging a, your vehicle at home overnight, not having to queue for some time in a public space or in a public um, or a private run company that provides these services in the, in the future. And uh, since we've got gas, electricity, water and telecommunications at our front door, I think this would be a great addition. Great, would anyone else like to speak to the amendment or do we? Councillor Pearl, did you want to close? No, thanks, Madam Mayor. Let's take the amendment to the vote. Uh, so let's go. Uh, Councillor Crawford, four. Councillor Consolo. Four. Councillor Martin. Four. Councillor Pearl. In favour. Councillor Sirikoff. Four. Councillor Baxter. Four. Councillor Bond. Four. Councillor Clark. I'm hoping you can hear me better now. Four. Yes, yes we can. Thank you. Councillor Copsey. Four. That uh, amendment is carried and now makes up the substantive motion. So in terms of the substantive motion, only myself and Councillor Martin have spoken. Would anyone else like to speak to the motion at large? Councillor Pearl. Thanks very much. I, I support this motion, albeit I don't know if we've got it right in terms of the settings. I don't think the time period is 
is long enough, but uh, I've decided not to put a motion up because I think uh, we'll be here all night, to be frank. Well, sorry, I want to put a motion up, but uh, I won't put an amendment to it. But I, I actually think three years is what's required to get get this working, uh, or as the CEO suggested previously, two years from the installation of the unit, because I suspect um, the, the permitting process for this across multiple agencies and the first time it's been done is going to take a bit of time. Uh, and then just to get the tradespeople to install this at the moment, um, just to get, uh, you know, Tiger tails on people's power lines at the moment. It's taking three months in some cases. So, uh, what I want this trial to um, have its best um, opportunities to succeed. I'm not sure that hard date of the 31st of December 2023 is going to work. But let, let, let's let's vote for it and see how we go. And if we have to adjust it, we'll have to adjust it um, based on the feedback we we get in. But um, as I said before, I think there's enough. Uh, people out there with enough coin that will be able to uh, fill those 10 spots um, to have the luxury of having a charging station out the front of their 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 house. It's 10 uh, units in total, which is tiny compared to the total number of houses here. Uh, I'm sure some people will think, think they're ugly, other people think they're a, a, an absolute masterpiece, but let's um, let's try this, see how it goes. I'm pretty confident once one of these six months recommendations come through anyway, the trial will be changed in any case. So, if there are people out there concerned it's only a two year trial uh, or actually by the time it's permitted, probably less than that. Um, I, I wouldn't fear too much. Just uh, give it a go and install it and have the convenience of being able to uh, power whatever your beautiful vehicle is um, up at the up at the front of your house. Let's um, I hope this works and I'll be interested to see the uh, when the first one's installed, but it won't be out the front of my house. Would anyone else like to speak to the the motion? Should we just put this to the vote? Oh, Councillor Copsey. Thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to thank you briefly for bringing the alt motion. Um, I think that the debate tonight has demonstrated that there's a lot of curiosity and interest from Council in seeing how this turns out. Um, I think it's fabulous and I just wanted to briefly mention the hard work of the officers who have been presented with a very novel um, proposal here and I have it on good authority have been very diligent in progressing um, a, an approach to this which means that council can be the first um, in the country to to enable a permit a use permit for this type of activity on our streets in a trial fashion I'm really excited about that uh, and I'm really glad that we have um, taken the initiative to to enable that and to see how this goes. I also am pleased to see the um, flexibility that I think the amendment provides for a shorter trial period if possible, but also the possible possibility of extensions if we do find that things take longer. You know, that could be the case where uh, a little bit in uncharted territory here. But I am really excited if we have success here that um, we can enable uh, this technology to be available to those who are um, willing to make the investment and um, and are seeking to help have a more environmentally friendly uh, and quiet and efficient way to get around our city in an EV rather than a um, petrol combustion vehicle. So it's really it's very, very exciting to be trying this out. Um, I expect we're going to learn a lot through this process and that's okay. And I am very, very glad that um, really just that the capacity has been there to develop something new in Port Phillip that I hope will end up being a great example uh, that we can then share with other local governments because I know that we're not the only municipality where people are really, really excited about embracing this technology and in reducing their emissions footprint um, from trans from transport, which we know is a huge contributor to our community emissions profile here in the city. The only other thing that I wanted to say, I have forgotten, I'm not feeling very, <laughs> it must be lockdown getting to me, but I'm really excited to see how this goes. I wish the officers all the best in rolling this process out 
and uh, like other councillors, I really look forward to the next update where we can see uh, whether we need to change anything in our approach to this or if we can progress to making a policy that enables... Oh, that's what I wanted to say, sorry. Uh, I really wanted to acknowledge the um, tension that Councillor Bond brought to light. Obviously, we're talking about dealing with public property here, so um, a permit is the right way to... Um, to tackle that tension and I thank the officers for the thought that's gone into balancing those objectives. Would anyone else like to speak to the motion? No, then I'll briefly close. Uh, yes, it's been a very interesting discussion tonight and it does show the complexity of, of any of these being first cab off the rank. I also would like to thank the officers, um, particularly Remy, who I know has been working hard on it, and Rod for bringing uh, such an interesting innovation to the city of Port Phillip, and we look forward to seeing how the trial uh, the trial trial proceeds. So, councillors, let's put that to the vote. Uh, Councillor Crawford for Councillor Consolo. Four. Councillor Martin. Four. Councillor Pearl. Five. Councillor Sirikov. Four. Councillor Baxter. Four. Councillor Bond. Four. Councillor Clark. Four. Councillor Coxey. Four. That motion is carried unanimously. Moving on to 12.1, which is the business advisory group, the terms of reference and councillor representation. Councillors, do we have any questions of the officers on this report? No, if not, uh, we have an officer's recommendation. Is that a councillor bond to move? Do I have a seconder? Uh, Councillor Pearl, Councillor Bond, um, would you clarify what you are moving, please? I should probably should that before Mark is... before we get yeah. <laughs> I realise that um, too. Councillor Clark and Councillor Sirikoff as the councillor delegates to the business advisory committee. Councillor Pearl, are you uh, agreeable with that to second it? Yes. Great. Uh, okay, Councillor Bond. Um, no need to speak to it. I think this is a, a, a good initiative of council for us to listen to our business community um, and give them problems with which they can provide uh, council feedback on from their perspective as as a variety of businesses within our uh, community. And, and I think Councillor Clark and Councillor Sirikoff have shown great passion for uh, our business community during their last we're doing up to now about 10, 11 months on, on council. Um, and I'm sure they will be worthy uh, members of this particular committee and represent council, council well. Councillor Pearl? No? No, okay. very fine. Thank you. Uh, be happy to think on what Councillor Bond said. Thank you. Anyone else like to speak to the motion? I'll briefly speak. I think it's good to clarify. I know that this um, this uh, advisory group is new and like all advisory groups, it takes time to settle and figure out exactly what we can uh, do. But um, tapping into the expertise of, of businesses across the um, municipality is an excellent thing. And I look forward to hear, hearing the reports back as delegates listening to and bringing uh, information back to us and, and, and vice versa, a two-way street. So I look forward to um, hopefully these terms of reference uh, clarify a bit more and make it a, a, a smoother process for all involved. Uh, Councillor Clark. Thanks, Madam Mayor, and thanks, um, Councillor Bond and, and Pearl. Uh, I think I have enjoyed being on this uh, committee and the, the, the business people who are on it uh, are very experienced and provide very good advice for Council and uh, subject to this motion uh, being approved by councillors. Uh, I look forward to participating in uh, in the committee further and seeing how we can be a conduit between the committee and council and council lawyers uh, around bringing some business advice and hopefully strengthening and improving our um, high streets and business and with the goal of improving our economic development and job opportunities for all of the residents in our municipality. So, um, hopefully looking forward to the support of the councillors and participating further in this business advisory group. Thank you. Councillor Sirikoff. 
I think councillor Clark just took the words right out of my mouth, uh, being that conduit between council and the uh, businesses across uh, Port Phillip. I know they're a very enthusiastic group and they want to get their businesses uh, going and to uh, be working with the council to achieve a great outcome for the traders and businesses. And so I'm really looking forward um, to working with them and to uh, get good outcomes. Thank you. Anyone else would like to speak to the motion? Rounding back to Councillor Bond. Uh, no, thank you, Madam Mayor. All right, let's put that to the vote. Everyone, Councillor Consolo. Four. Councillor Martin. Four. Councillor Pearl. In favour. Councillor Surikoff. Four. Councillor Baxter. Four. Councillor Bond. Four. Councillor Clark. Four. Councillor Copsey. Four. Councillor Crawford, four. The motion is carried. Moving on to 12.2, the St Kilda Festival 2022. Uh, so, councillors, we have a uh, recommend, recommendation, a report from officers. Do we have any questions for the officers? Uh, all right, I've got a, a move. Okay, uh, we've got a question from Councillor Sirikoff and I already have a mover, thank you, when we get there. Oh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, um, I would like uh, Council to pl uh, please clarify, um, if in the event of Council um, had to cancel the um, St Kilda Festival, whether it be one month, two months out or seven days out, what would be the cost to uh, Council? Uh, we'll go to Lauren Bilkala. Uh, through you, Mayor, I might throw to Adele Dennison. Yes, Adele. Through you, Mayor, the answer to that is dependent on when the cancellation would happen and how close to the event. Uh, however, knowing that there is somewhat a, a risk of that, officers would negotiate every contract and supplier agreement with flexibility and milestone payments to uh, ensure that any any money committed to wouldn't be wouldn't be sunk in the event of a cancellation. Um, can you provide um, a little bit more clarification to that to what we received at brief briefings, please? Uh, I'll just go to Carly Bennett's before I go back to you, Adele. Uh, through you, Mayor, um, officers uh, published some additional information on Council's website uh, today um, to provide that clarity for councillors, but also to the community and, and officers did brief councillors on that at uh, the council briefing. Uh, on page six of the report that's on council's website, uh, if the event was cancelled in December, uh, the advice is that staffing cost incurred and committed to would be $200,000. Uh, artists contracted and committed to would be $210,000 and infrastructure and supplier costs contracted and committed to would be $500,000. Uh, those costs increase uh, dependent upon when the event is cancelled. So if it was cancelled in uh, January, those costs would increase further. Uh, and if the event was cancelled within seven days, they increase um, further again. Um, certainly, uh, officers would do their best uh, in terms of establishing contracts uh, and arrangements um, with respect to the festival. Um, however, if if the event was cancelled um, or needed to be rescheduled, uh, there, there would be sunk costs and officers wouldn't be able to mitigate uh, the financial risk uh, in total to council. Uh, and I, I might just add Adele or Lauren may wish to add further. Um, oh, yes. Adele or Lauren? No. Um, I have nothing further. I don't know if Adele does. No, I have nothing further to add unless there's further specific questions. Could I ask a question, if I may? Um, as part of uh, the St Kilda Festival, are we seeking uh, further funding from state or federal government to help um, offset some of the costs, particularly around COVID, uh, being COVID safe? Uh, it's the first part to my question. And second part, uh, if there was a cancellation due to weather, inclement weather, 
um, which we can never control, uh, would it would be similar kind of costs that we would be risking. Is that a Dell? Yes, it's a Dell here through you, Mayor. In answer to the first question, yes, we're in conversation with both federal and state government representatives about funding for the 2022 potential St Kilda Festival um, in recognition that public health settings are likely to put pressure on both expenditure and income for the festival budget. Which is which is common across the entire event sector, um, and those conversations are ongoing. With regards to the second part of your question, yes, the St Kilda Festival has always been vulnerable to um, to cancellation, whether that be for extreme weather or emergency services commitments at the last minute or um, any other external settings. I guess the advantage we have this year is that we see that potential risk coming and can build some contingencies into contracts and agreements and, and would do so from the outset. Thank you. Any further questions? All right, we have a mover, Councillor Bond to move. So Councillor Bond, will you just, uh, before I go to a seconder, uh, would you clarify what you exactly, which option you are moving? Uh, option 1A. Option 1A, could we please insert that? And Councillor Martin, are you okay to second that option? Most certainly. Great, Councillor Bond. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor, and thank you Adele for all the hard work she's done on this and Alice for her little cameo earlier. Um, in the in the council meeting, making her thoughts on the St Kilda Festival known, no doubt. Um, so why do we need the St Kilda Festival? Um, earlier today, I went. Oh. Sorry, just was self on mute. Um, earlier today, I went down to Ackland Street after today's announcements, and all the traders I spoke to about three or four traders, and they were all a bit flat. Um, I think they were hoping for a little bit more than than what they got today, there were people out and about enjoying themselves, but they weren't able to really um, patronise our businesses as they normally would. They're not able to sit down, have a drink, not able to sit down and eat, not able to you know, enjoy a meal. So it's, the traders are, are really, really struggling down there. Um, and, and they just want to get back to doing what it is, what it is they do best, which is something we, we all want to do. Um, we need to learn to live with um, this COVID virus. It's not going away. So the sooner we all get back to our normal um, lives and living our normal lives, which means going to work, which means going out, which means St Kilda hosting events like the St Kilda Festival, we will all be um, much better off both financially and, and mentally. I think the, the toll mentally is starting to tell on a few people now. Um, this is not the St Kilda Festival as we, we've known it in, in previous years, the previous 40 something years that we've hosted a St Kilda Festival. It's a slightly different version um, that's spread out over a few days, over nine days. It's slightly, or going to be, not slightly, but a, a considerably smaller than we have done previously. But it's going to be our first step back into hosting events um, into St Kilda uh, and Port Phillip with um, with hopefully a majority of the population being being vaccinated and able to come out and enjoy themselves. Yes, there is a risk that this this won't go ahead, but that risk will occur no matter when we hold this. Um, it could happen any weekend over the you know, the next two or three years where the government might suddenly change the rules. So holding this later or holding this um, at a different date, a different time, in a different manner, we're, we're going to be exposed to that risk. So I don't think any other option reduces that, that risk um, to us. I think there's a lot of people would know I'm a big supporter of the St Kilda Festival. Yes, it's a great day. We all come along and have fun. But it is also, and I, and I raise this every time someone questions the, the, the worth of the St Kilda Festival, it is also a great economic um, stimulant to, to St Kilda. We've done surveys over many, many years, intercept surveys, um, which are, yes, they're, they're, they're surveys, but they're reasonably accurate, which 
every time we do one indicates we get a, a return of somewhere between 25 and 30 million dollars to the to Port Phillip, and that's primarily spent in St Kilda on that day, for our investment of 1.7, 1.8 million dollars, um, which is an incredible return on investment, and it's as good as any return on investment for any event held in Melbourne. The Grand Prix does not get anywhere near that 14, 15 times return on investment. Um, the tennis might, but you know, Moomba definitely doesn't. Very few events in Melbourne deliver the return on investment for the St Kilda, for, um, for traders, for local the local economy, as does the St Kilda Festival, which is why I'm, I'm a big supporter of this, because it, it helps our traders on Ackland Street, Fitzroy Street, um, at, along the foreshore there. They all do well out of that day. I won't say all, they, most of them do well out of the day. Obviously, the St Kilda Festival is not suited to some businesses, but where, where it is a hospitality, entertainment um, business, they, they all do well, they all make an effort, um, and it is it is their largest trading day um, of of the year. And you've only got to go and speak to any traders down in and around St Kilda, the ones that put on a bit of effort. You know, they, 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 they need this um, because, of, because of the way it uh, returns money to them. So from an economic point of view, it, it is a great outcome for St Kilda. Um, in terms of the way we are going to uh, get back to you know, what's going to be the new COVID normal, I think the mood in the community is we just want to get on and do things. We just want to go back to the way we were. Yes, it will be slightly different. We all have to get vaccinated. We'll may even have to show a COVID passport to to come on down and enjoy the St Kilda Festival next year and, and I'm, I'm okay with that because I, I just want to get back to normal. I know everyone I speak to in St Kilda just wants to get back to normal. The traders want to get back to norm, uh, normal and as soon as we as a level of government start behaving like we want to get back to normal, um, the, the sooner we will reach reach that point. Um, I know we could sit here and say yeah there's a chance it may be cancelled so let's not let's not approve it and you know keep um, keep counselling things and postponing things, but it's not good for us as a, as a community, as a society, if we just keep doing that, because we just can't keep living our lives like this. I'm, I'm, I'm struggling over the last few months. It's, it's terrible to sit at home. I sit in this chair all day, then at six o'clock I flick over to a council event or council briefing and spend my evenings in this chair as well. I, I just want to get out and you know, go and do something. And the sooner we as a level, a level of government, as a council, we actually lead in this space and say, yes, we are going to get back to normal. We are going to put on events, and you know, there, there will be ups and downs. It, it's not always going to be perfect. Um, we we may have to change things at the last minute and do things a little bit differently. But, geez, we just want to get back to doing things normally. And I think the sooner we bring back this St Kilda Festival, a small, you know, a different one next year, and then the year after we go back to having the big one, and we're all back to normal. So, strongly urge my fellow councillors to support this for for. For the benefit of not just St Kilda, but for the benefit of all of us, um, there's something in it for for all of us in us getting back to, back to normal here. Um, I know a number of councils have not experienced the St Kilda Festival the way um, those of us who have been on council before have, um, and 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 that's fine. And I think it's something you've just got to experience before you understand what it means to St Kilda, before you understand how big it is, and before you before you see for yourself the economic impact it will it will put into St Kilda and, and perhaps you need to see that firsthand before you you, know, you will support this and I understand that um, but I you know, strongly urge those that have seen this to know what it means to St Kilda to to help us all get back to normal and help us deliver um, this festival and I you know, wish the staff all the best in, in this it's not going to be easy it's going to be one of the first events being held in Melbourne um, and you know, wish them all the best and, and good luck. And I'm, I'm sure they will do a great job and, and do the City of Port Phillip proud when they put this together. Councillor Martin. Fully endorsed everything that Councillor Bond has said. And although I'm new on council, I've probably been to at least as many St Kilda festivals as Councillor Bond. And yeah, not only is it an iconic event, well, the iconic event in the City of Port Phillip, but it's one of Melbourne's iconic events as well. I'd like to congratulate the council officers on coming up with a modified program for next year's festival. 
having the multi-day festival. We're not putting all our eggs in one basket. We are going to be in new times next year, but whether it's February, whether it's April, or whether it's September, we're going to be in some strange new environment of COVID normal. As Councillor Bond has said, we may be carrying our vaccination certificates. We're probably going to have everyone with 85%, you know, 90% vaccinations. Things are going to be different, but they're not going to change very much. So whether we hold the festival in February, whether we hold the festival in April, whether we hold two festivals at various times, we're going to con confront the same sorts of issues, whether it's the weather, whether it's um, some strange COVID event, who knows. But I think our risks with the multi dose and killer festival, we're mitigating the risks of weather, which has always been a major issue. Some of us have memories of being absolutely drowned outside Luna Park on the afternoon of the St Kilda Festival. 100,000 people enjoy themselves in the rain. Um, but with, with the multi-day event, we're minimising a number of other events, or sorry, and we're minimising a number of adverse outcomes. We're also allowing events to be run at a slightly smaller scale, so it's going to be much easier to run events in a COVID normal way, whether we need ticketing, whether we need fencing, whatever, far easier to do that on a number of slightly smaller events rather than trying to boil our, boil our eggs in, in, in the one basket. As Councillor Bond has said, it's going to bring an enormous amount of money into our municipal, look after many of our local traders who have gone to the wall in the last few months. It's not just our local traders though, as Councillor Bond has said, it's going to help all of us. Um, Bondi, I can see you sitting there, you, you haven't got your normal suntan, I know how you're feeling. I think I know how the rest of us are feeling. Those of you who are out there watching um, what, watching this live, I'm sure you're sitting in your living rooms or in your studies, you're also feeling it. This is going to be a fantastic opportunity for us to break off the shackles and over a period of a few days, for the first time, start to enjoy ourselves. And the St Kilda Festival is going to, I believe, lead Melbourne into COVID normal. Again, the City of Port Phillip being a major leader in Australia. I commend the motion to you. Would anyone else like to speak to the motion? Councillor Consolo. All right. Uh, St Kilda Fest has been a long log event. We would like to go back to pre-pandemic and enjoy the freedoms of everyday life and the easy opportunity to attend a large public event. I hear the strong desire from the callers tonight to have this festival in February. I agree it would be the fun we want and the lifeline the area needs. However, this pandemic, uh, this pandemic has been horrible, but it's still not over. Here we are on lockdown, quite similar to 2020, though there is a difference with the vaccines. Reading the news around the world that even when vaccinated, there are still concerns. We also have to remember there is no plan to vaccinate under 12 year old kids and this year they are getting COVID. We need, we were so lucky last year to be nearly COVID free, but ironically there was a lockdown the weekend the St. Kilda Festival would have been. I hope I'm wrong but I can't let my hope and desire for a normal life outweigh my responsibility to vote on ratepayers' money, for which I do not think a large scale public event in one day or a, smaller, a little smaller across nine days is a good idea within half a year from now. None of us have a crystal ball to see what February 2020 is gonna look like. However, I cannot ignore the significant risk of cancellation or a really reduced outcome. The, the economic benefit might be nowhere near what has been in the past. I'd also like to add traders are struggling in Port Melbourne, South Melbourne, Albert Park, Middle Park, and so on, not just St Kilda. It isn't fair to only focus on St Kilda at this time and often. I have to represent my inner town. Why does St Kilda get only this concentrated economic benefit? The South Melbourne Jubilee and Port Melbourne Festival were also loved events that don't exist anymore. I read this week about a similar upcoming event in Austin, Texas, where I used to live uh, it's this month. They are fully open but require COVID negative tests within three days or a vaccine passport, passport for people to attend. So are we prepared to require something similar? And we're not even to that level of understanding what, the, what we will be required to do. Maybe if it wasn't so much money, it wouldn't matter. I think we should cancel the event and I foreshadow I would move an amendment to for option three if uh, this one failed. Or I guess, I don't know how that works, whatever. Um, and, I think this money should be used in our community in other ways. Uh, Councillor Sirikoff. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, two weeks ago, I asked councillors why was the St Kilda Festival cancelled for 2021? 
the response was because we were in COVID uh, lockdown. Today, we are dealing with a more virulent coronavirus and in the third extension of lockdown six. And unfortunately, we will be facing more lockdowns because of, the, of this uh, stringent COVID safety measures by the state government. As we all know, the MCG on grand final day is filled to capacity with 100 footy supporters. St Kilda Festival has a reputation to attract four times that, 400 visitors on one day. Even with a reduced St Kilda Festival attendance of some 10%, this would be around 40,000 um, uh, people attending. I would like to know how would council really put in place a COVID safe event with safe distancing and wearing masks at a musical music festival? The last thing COP wants to be responsible for is a coronavirus uh, super spreader event. The unflow effect of this could be and would most likely be uh, that we would be back. Uh, we would be back to homeschooling for primary and secondary students and parents, and businesses closing once again. As stated in this report, uh, public health restrictions are having a significant uh, impact on all events and public gatherings, and the St Kilda Festival is not immune to the lockdowns. Um, let's also not ignore that the St Kilda Festival costs more than $1.7 million. And if it is a, if it is cancelled anywhere up to two up to th two months ahead of the event, council would lose up to 1.1 million dollars. This is a huge risk when we are not out of COVID, and it is gambling with council money and ratepayers money when we have gone through snap lockdowns with only five cases. To be risking the safety of the community and, and further lockdowns in a, not a, is not a risk we can really afford to take. I am called the St Kilda Festival and it is, a part of the, it is part of the DNA of Port Phillip and a vehicle for many cultural events. And I can hear the desperation uh, and the keenness of those people who spoke tonight so that we get back to normal life and we can enjoy festivals and hearing all the wonderful musicians, singers that we have to come to the, this great event. The way that I see it is when we know there is more certainty to stage a COVID safe St Hilda, when vaccination rates are 80% for people, this including those who are um, around the ages of 12, and we, are, and we are not gambling and risking council funds, that is the time to go ahead with a festival. If the festival's cancelled now, or up to two months beforehand, we've lost $1.1 million with very little to hold another St Kilda Festival down the road. We need, we need to just to wait a little longer than uh, uh, next February for a safe occasion to gather and participate in live music. Until then, I, I'm not supporting 1A because that locks us too, it's just too soon as far as I can see. Any of the other um, options are better because it delays it when, we, when we've got those vaccination rates up and we know what, what's happening with this coronavirus. And until then, really, if it's not um, option 1B2, I'm going for three, because even option three, even though we, we would be cancelling the event, we've still got that $1.7 million to hold an event um, to hold an event and maybe it's multiple events across Port Phillip. Thank you. All right, anyone else to speak to the motion? Uh, Councillor Copsey. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I hear over and over again when, when it comes to um, our discussions around the festival that we need to wait and we need to wait and we need to wait till we've got more certainty. The reality of planning this festival um, is that there are, there are decisions that need to be made now in order for a successful festival to go ahead. So tonight what officers are requesting is clarity around Council's intent uh, and I am fully supportive of option 1A um, as our current direction. Um, I'm so excited for when we can come back and have a COVID safe St Kilda Festival. And 
there's been, you know, there's been really great discussion tonight. I actually want to endorse um, everything that Councillor Martin and um, Councillor Bond have said about the incredible benefit that St Kilda Festival brings. No, we're not going to be back to normal next year. And in fact, you know, back to normal is probably a misnomer. What we are going to try and establish is the new normal and the COVID normal. And um, one of the things that we do know is that there is an entire creative industry crying out for support to find out what that looks like. There is our hospitality industry and our tourism industry in Port Phillip also crying out to find out what that looks like. One of the really important roles that we can play in Port Phillip is being part of creating that solution. And I know that there is a strong opportunity from state and federal government support to also explore what that looks like um, so that we can have safe outdoor events once again. I think in that sense, St Kilda Festival is such a fantastic opportunity for once again, for us to show leadership and to support those industries that bring so much to our city, so much um, economic benefit and support. So, you know, for the people who are involved in those industries, their livelihoods, uh, which have been so severely impacted by this pandemic, but also for the rest of us, so much joy. I, um, you know, funnily enough, uh, maybe I'm an optimist, but I booked my tickets today for the Port Ferry Folk Festival campsite. Shout out to Moinshire. I hope very much to be visiting your lovely campgrounds um, around this time. We, if we are ever going to establish this new normal, we actually do have to plan for it and planning for it um, has to begin now. Uh, there's been a bit of discussion about the fact that there's always risks associated with hosting festivals um, and St Kilda Festival being an outdoor festival on a, you know, sometimes very windy foreshore is no exception to that. Uh, I've got full confidence that our festivals team are some of the best in the business when it comes to this and that they will be very, very thorough in exploring not only what needs to be done in order to run the festival safely, but also very transparent with council about um, the options and the considerations that will need to go into that. So I'm really hopeful that we'll continue tonight, um, continue, you know, set the direction tonight and continue that conversation so that we can maximise our chance for a great event. I do think that holding the event as a multi-day event in um, February is a really good option. Um, I'm quite content to support this at the moment. I do agree that some of the risks that have been spoken about tonight will persist um, and hopefully we'll be in a really good spot with vaccination by the time we reach February um, so that some of these risks can be minimised. I also wanted to give a really big shout out to the music industry and the festivals industry who have done their bit in um, promoting vaccination and uh, the V for vaccine uh, campaign that I've seen up on rock posters. It's just fantastic. The music community continues to give so much when you've already had so much taken. So I just really want to thank you. I think that this is a way that we can um, do a gesture and be part of that recovery um, for a, an industry that brings so much economic benefit uh, to our community locally, but also so much joy. And I think that um, also councillors, you know, would remember that we have actually already staged COVID safe outdoor music events in the city and had a really great um, run at doing that. I think the February staging makes a lot of sense because there are probably some really great um, alignments we can do with other events that will be on at that stage, which will also overall mean that this is more bang for our buck. Um, in hosting the festival in the February 2022. So that's why I'm very, very happy to support this motion tonight for option 1A and touch wood. But, um, you know, I think that this will be wonderful if we can pull it off. And if anyone can pull it off, it's our fantastic festivals team and all our beautiful creative artists in Port Phillip and our amazing supportive community who I know love live music. Uh, Councillor Pearl. Thanks, Madam Mayor. Um, the argument around rate payers' money is a very valid one, but it's one that in, in two parts probably should have been done in the budget process. This money's been in the budget, so if you didn't support the St Kilda Festival, that was the uh, most formal opportunity to remove it from the budget. And um, the argument about rate payers' money 
is an interesting one and it's very, very valid in many respects. And I've heard people throughout this debate saying if you had a million dollars or $2 million of your own money, would you be investing it or putting it at risk like this? And the answer to that is obviously probably not. Um, but having said that, if I had $235 million income with a $6 million surplus, uh, a million dollars of risk for the potential economic upside of this equation, uh, makes fairly logical sense to somebody that is traditionally fairly economic conservative. Uh, from a return profile, from an economics point of view, uh, it's almost unrivaled. Um, you've got to take a risk sometime in this game. And one of the biggest criticisms we have, uh, we receive, is not supporting things that are innovative, not moving fast enough, placing bureaucracy in the way of getting things moving uh, and not getting enough done. And I, in the past, I think I'm the only councillor here that's actually voted against the St Kilda Festival in the, in the past, because my vision for the festival has always been one of a bit more economic stability and over two years, I would like to see the festival run. So every second year instead of every one year. Um, I, I don't think anyone here can doubt the economic impact that this festival has. So if you're going to make a gamble, as some people put it, such as this, you need to know the facts in terms of what you're gambling against. And the current vaccination rate in Victoria was 105,000 jabs today, total jabs of 5 million doses in, doses in total. If you extrapolate that across double dosage across the population, by the end of November, we will be at 80 per cent. Um, that provides uh, four or five clear months to work out how we're going to run this event safely and to ensure that we're getting the efficient return and the sufficient return, rather, on the ratepayers' money that we're putting at risk here. Now, this event always has a risk to it in terms of ratepayers' money. It could, you could have the 50 year storm, you could have all sorts of type of equations um, from a risk point of view that means ratepayers will lose money on this event. But over the average of the year that's been running, it produces a sizable return to uh, that end of our municipality, and that can't be doubted. To restart it is an important stage in terms of the branding and marketing of the festival and uh, the economic vibrancy of our whole community, not just St Kilda, but the whole community in general. So if we took the balanced risk approach that some wish to take to this festival, um, perhaps that approach should be taken to other projects, because I've seen other projects uh, on this council, um, South Melbourne Life Saving Club jumps to mind, all sorts of projects uh, which put more value at risk than what we're debating here with a whole lot less community benefit um, that doesn't get an iota of council time or even uh, one grimace of a councillor actually doing the sums and working the facts out. So if you really truly view that this wasn't value for money uh, from a ratepayer point of view, that argument was at the budget. So the only thing you need to look at at the moment is what the evidence of this uh, event has from an economic standpoint and the benefit it has for St Kilda and the whole city. Then you need to work out the probability of losing a million dollars worth of ratepayers' money, which I think on a health basis is medium to low, and from an operational risk point of view, medium to high, but we have sufficient time to be able to work those challenges out. So albeit I'm probably one of the most vicious critics among you of the St Kilda Festival, I'll be supporting Councillor Bond's motion here this evening uh, because I've done the balance of probabilities and I'm happy to take the gamble. And if it goes wrong, I'll be the first person and happy to take any public criticism around the judgments that we're making here this evening. Uh, and I'm happy for you to hold me to that also. But um, yeah, I'll go hard on this one because I think we need to get out of this kingdom we're living in. And um, this is the perfect way to do it. So, councillors, I think it's worth the risk. I've given you some numbers. You know, I run an insurance company. You know, I have a financial markets background. I don't take risk lightly. I think this one's worth taking. And if it goes wrong, I'll be more than happy to deface the public face of the mistake. Thanks, Councillor Pearl. Um, I'll briefly speak to the motion. I'll be supporting this motion. I cried tonight. 
uh, listening to some of the speeches from the various people that rang, um, rang in to 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 talk for and in their support mostly for the St Kilda Festival 2022. Uh, I have had tears earlier today because for today um, I think the significance of being on council in a city that is so focused economically on hospitality, on events and uh, the creative industries. Um, a continued lockdown with the end in sight only being possibly high vaccination rates. And um, I probably even cry now. The arts and events and hospitality communities have been so decimated. I think this is a way of one, encouraging people to vaccinate, vaccinate and vaccinate, but two, to invest back into those particular industries in our community. A lot of them live and work and pay rates in this area. And I see it as an investment. And if some of that money, God forbid, it doesn't go ahead, that's money back into pockets of people who are doing it so damn hard. I'm fine with that personally, because that's money that they'll spend back at the local coffee shop or the local retailer or the whatever, or put food on the table for their families. For some artists, it's that bad. So I'm fine. Yes, it's a large amount of money, but we also make money at a parking that's not direct ratepayers' money. So think of it as being money that's taken from those bonus. We looked at it, we just voted for an option to see if we can get $300,000 worth of bike parks, uh, bike paths funded by the state government. There are other ways to recoup the money through different to different levels of government on different projects that are not available necessarily to this. This is an investment back into our community that is on its knees. So I'm really asking you to support this one. It's an investment back into the many traders, the many creatives, the many events companies that live, work in this city, and this is a start for them to recover on the other side. Um, and they live across the city. They don't, it's not just focused So the money going back to them, although the event is in St Kilda, the money goes more broadly. We also, and that hopefully, and, and um, I'm planning on writing a letter to the treasurer for specific support for these industries. But one of the things that we will be re referencing and there has been raised uh, in federal parliament is a national insurance scheme for events. And I urge, I urge the federal government to take that on with, and work with states so that these kind of events can go ahead and some of that money can be recouped if God forbid uh, it has to be canceled for um, COVID reasons. We need this insurance scheme. So there is opportunity to perhaps look to the future, not just getting funding from other levels of government, but to put in place an insurance scheme that may make these things more possible in 2022. Um, I'm going, I always say I'm going to be short, but I usually am. Look, I just feel that in my, in my heart and soul today, we need to invest, it's, think of this as an investment. There's always a risk in anything we do on council, whether it'll be delivered on time, whether all of those things as Councillor Pearl so um, eloquently put, but this is actually an investment back into our creative and hospitality communities and events communities. And it is a start uh, and they will invest that money back into the city of Port Phillip. So I ask you to support this motion. Councillor Clark. Thanks, Madam Mayor. Um, so the St Kilda Festival is a great festival for St Kilda um, and have no doubt about it and in normal, whatever that means anymore, non-COVID times, uh, it would be well supported. However, as much as I don't want it to be the case, we are in anything but normal COVID, normal times. Um, unfortunately, we're in our sixth lockdown. It's been for nearly a month and it can't be ignored that it's just been extended for another 23 days. Uh, I am very hopeful that 70% of people will have a vaccination in October, um, but by the end of, um, currently by the end of September, as is foreshadowed by the government today, you can't have anyone at your house. You can't meet anyone outside. You can't exercise at a gym. You can't go fishing. You can't do most things, unfortunately. Um, I hope that the lockdown will end. Um, and as uh, Councillor Bond said, I share his uh, passion that we learn to live with this. Uh, and like uh, many of the other councillors have said, that we actually um, have some hope and are given, you know, get back to where we were. 
But no matter, I think as Councillor Consolo said, how much we wish uh, that to be the way, uh, there's nobody uh, currently in this virtual room that can know that or know that what things are going to look like in December or January. And no amount of hoping that we can plan events because we want them to happen, uh, unfortunately changes that outcome or the risk profile associated with that. Council and council takes, um, normally take, is risk averse and takes prudent steps as it moves uh, and makes decisions. And that is our role as councillors um, to make prudent decisions on behalf of the ratepayers that we represent. Um, the risk of the festival needing to be cancelled is possibly high, um, but most importantly, I can't make that prediction and nor can anyone else in this room. And that is exactly the point. We cannot know. Um, and should this festival need to be cancelled, uh, what we do actually know, the only thing that we know uh, currently is that as Councillor um, Sirikoff said, that will cost ratepayers 910,000 in December, 1.1 million in January. And if it proceeds beyond that and then gets cancelled within seven days, it'll be 1.2 million. Uh, and maybe not everyone in the community understands that you cannot insure for COVID. So this money is just lost. Um, residents are paying more in rates this year. And, and yet we're having a discussion about risking about a million dollars in the most unpredictable times of our lifetimes. Um, we've had a lot of speakers today, uh, many not from our municipality, supporting the festival and suggesting there is minimal risk. Um, but perhaps they've not seen the council papers that were uploaded today, which did outline the risks and the cost uh, of it, unfortunately, if it had to be cancelled. Um, and as you know, we are all very concerned about the loss of income for the artists and the musicians, but it's not the right payer of Port Phillips' job to risk a million dollars of their money that they've funded to try and fix this difficult and unfortunate issue. The framework of reviewing this million dollars or viewing this million dollars out of $240 million uh, is not correct in my view as every million dollars has to be funded by the residents. And so every million dollars matters. Uh, it's, it's not that it's 1 million out of 240 is small, but it's still a million dollars that are paid for, not by us, by the residents. Um, and I'm sure they might want to do something else with that million dollars. Unfortunately, COVID risks are almost impossible to mitigate or manage out as the council officers' very papers tell us that. They have put their best efforts to try and work out how they can mitigate the risk, change things, put in some clauses that perhaps we could have a, a music concert later or the artists can reschedule. Despite all of their best efforts, um, they, you know, the ability to mitigate is very difficult. You've got infrastructure that's at least 600,000 of those millions that cannot be mitigated in any way if we had to cancel those events. So um, I think you have to ask yourself that as uh, has been said, if it was you being asked to put up your million dollars of your own money for this festival, would you? And the answer is no. And if that's the answer, then I don't believe any of us in this room have the right to risk ratepayers' money either. Uh, and for those reasons, I won't be supporting this motion. Okay, anyone else want to speak? Councillor Bond, do you want to close? Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Just briefly to thank the staff for the efforts they've put in to prepare this paper and the efforts they've put in in all the um, St Kilda festivals past. Um, thank those that spoke tonight, including um, the heads of our two local traders groups and um, the, the CEO from Luna Park, um, who came along to represent the four shore traders for uh, taking the time and coming along here tonight. Um, you know, I, you know, I really am hoping we're right here um, for the, you know, because if we're wrong and this doesn't go ahead, there's going to be a lot bigger problems in and around St Kilda than the, than the $1.7 million council won't lose. None of these businesses will be around. And I, I say that with all honesty, Luna Park won't be around if, if we're still in lockdown in five months time. I can 
tell you that, and most of the businesses on Aquin Street and Fitzroy Street won't be around if we're still in lockdown in five months' time. We're still living the way we're living today. So we have to hope we move on. We have to hope that that, that we're better. And I'm confident that we're, we're vaccinated enough and I've got my vaccine little certificate on my phone loaded already for the for the time I'm allowed to get out and show it at, at a bar and get myself a beer, hopefully in the not too distant future. But and, and that's just how we're going to have to live with the St Kilda Festival, um, so that we can all get on with our lives. Because it's just you know, the, the the possibility that this um, doesn't go ahead is is going to be so much more damaging than than where we are now. And then and the damage is going to be a lot more than just 1.7 million dollars to the city of Port Phillip. So you know, I understand why people are not prepared to take the risk and, and back this, and, and I'm okay with that. Um, but just yeah, urge my fellow councillors to to support it. And you know, we we lead in this space, and we lead in Melbourne, and show that we need to get on and live our lives. And whatever that happens to look like in in February next year, we need, do need to live our lives. We can't live like this forever. It's been too long. It's been long enough. Um, you know, there's people out there that are. That, that need to get back and do what they do, whether the, you know, all the artists and the musicians and the people that build the stages and sell the food and 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 um, all the other things that happen in and around St Kilda Festival and in and around St Kilda. So, you know, we we have to get on and do this. We have to get on and live our lives because the way we're currently living is just it's just not living, as far as I'm concerned. So, happy to to lead and happy to to give something for our community to attend in February next year. That I'm sure we we'll, we will all enjoy. I'm sure the officers who put it on will will do us proud. And yeah, they will have to change a few things along the way because not everything will go to plan. But um, I'm sure I've got no doubt what we end up with is going to be fantastic for for St Kilda and Port Phillip. All right, let's put that to the vote. Uh, Councillor Martin. Councillor Pearl. In favour. Councillor Sirikoff. Against. Councillor Baxter. For. Councillor Bond. For. Councillor Clark. Against. Councillor Copsey. For. Councillor Crawford. For. Councillor Consolo. Against. That motion is carried. Now, councillors, I'm very aware of the late hour and we've got quite a lot of items to get through. So I am going to ask um, uh, to consider whether we all need to speak to every item now that we've got through some of the really big ones. Um, and I will take a break in a couple of items time, but uh, if we can be succinct with um, uh, as we go through these next eight items or whatever it is. All right, item 13.1 is the Audit and Risk Community Biannual Report as of the 30th of June 2021 and the Annual Updated Audit and Risk Committee Charter. Do we have any questions for the officers in regards to this report? Uh, no, but we have a mover, Councillor Pearl, to move. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Martin. Councillor Pearl, would you like to speak to the item? Uh, thanks for the members of the committee and thanks for the report that's been tabled here this evening. Thank you. Councillor Martin. I'm going to work with the Board of Risk Committee, Public County Council's most important duty. Commend them for the work that they've done. Would anyone else like to speak to the motion? If not, I'm assuming you don't need to close. Councillor Pearl and I'll just move to the vote. Councillor Pearl. In favour. Councillor Sirikoff. For. Councillor Baxter. For. Councillor Bond. For. Councillor Clark. For. Councillor Copsey. For. Councillor Crawford. For. Councillor Consolo. For. Councillor Martin. For. The motion is carried. Moving on to 13.2, which is the intention to lease Jackson Street Car Park, 30 to 34 Jackson Street, St Kilda. Councillors, do we have any questions for officers on this report? No, uh, do I have a mover and seconder for this officer's recommendation or something different? Anyone? Uh, Councillor Bond to move. And Councillor Sirikoff to second. Councillor Bond, would you like to speak to the motion? Um, I won't because it's a late night, but yeah. You can. I don't, I'm wrong. I'm just asking if it will be succinct. 
All right, I'll be very succinct. Um, this is about um, you know, looking at opportunities for this site in and around uh, Fitzroy Street. Um, I've got strong views on the, the triangle, that the triangle should, needs to be so much more than just a car park. This is another location that can be a car park and so much more than a car park at the same time. So with, it's about having a look at what, what opportunities are out there. Um, it will remain in council hands, but we can incorporate our currently current parking into, into something that may or may not be available to happen on this site. Councillor Sarah Cox. Yeah, I can only just concur with um, Councillor Bond that, you know, um, if there is going to be uh, uh, some inspiring building going in, the, in there with a um, also a car park with the same number of uh, car spaces made available, I think this could be a positive thing um, for in that precinct. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak to the motion? No, we'll round back to you, Councillor Bond. Do you need to close? Uh, no, I don't. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Let's put that to the vote. Uh, Councillor Sirikoff? Four. Councillor Baxter? Four. Councillor Bond? Four. Councillor Clark? Four. Councillor Copsey? Four. Councillor Crawford? Four. Councillor Consolo? Oh, four. Councillor Martin? Four. Councillor Pearl? In favour. That motion is carried. Moving on to 13.3, the intention to sell uh, 351 St Kilda Road, St Kilda and Councillor Copsey. Thank you. As advised, I own a property within the general area of 351 St Kilda Road and out of an abundance of caution to avoid potential conflict I will leave, or, or perceived conflict, I will leave the meeting for this matter. All right, um, we'll text you when it's time to come back in. Thank you. Okay, councillors, do we have any questions for uh, the officers in regards to this report? Uh, uh, Councillor Martin. Through you, Matt. Is there any reason why council at a later date couldn't choose to use the funds that it gains from the sale of this property to, to go towards the creation of additional green space in the Balaclava East St Kilda area? Um, is that Anthony Sabnikov? Yes, it is. Thank you, Mayor. Um, there's no reason council couldn't uh, decide that. Right. Uh, Councillor Clark. Thanks, Madam Mayor. Uh, my question relates to uh, cl clarifying that Section 421 says uh, or references that offering a financial incentive where the development includes housing for very low income and low income households. And it says that this incentive would involve an abated purchase price. Could you please clarify what exactly that means? Through you, Mayor. Um, at a high level, it means that we'd go, the proposal is to go to the, the open market, um, ex consider bids no less than market price um, and it would be, as an option, uh, a bidder could elect to offer to provide uh, social or affordable housing. Now, if they did that, um, they'd still have an upfront purchase price, and not only would they need to promise to do it, but actually deliver it. Deliver it. So once they delivered it, um, then the price would be abated. What so does that mean? You'd give them a reduction in the price, sorry? Co correct. So, for instance, you'd put up a, um, a deposit and then a bond for the remainder of the purchase price and then subject to delivery, uh, you'd recover that bond. And how do you determine what that discount is? Uh, we'd, we haven't at this stage uh, developed the evaluation plan and the weighting and scoring. Could you give some indication of what you might expect that to be? For you, Mayor, uh, Chris, Chris Carroll, Carroll yeah. given that this would be subject to a commercial process, probably not probably best not for us to discuss that in a public council meeting. Yep. Okay, uh, so we'll go on to Councillor Sarah Koff. Uh, you're just following up on the, the uh, questions from Councillor Clark. I'm just wondering. Um, how does one really vote on this when um, it's going out to market price? 
market value. And if it is purchased by somebody who has social housing, then what is the worth to council in a return so that they can then spend the money elsewhere as suggested by um, another councillor for um, open space? So I'm just wondering, you know, um, what we get out of this for developments other, other, in other locations. Um, through you, Mayor. Yes, Tony Cannon. Uh, the main thing it would deliver is council policy. Council's policy currently in our backyard <clears throat> is to make uh, a, ma a amount of council land available for social housing development. So this proposal would enable us to test, <clears throat> um, to go to market and our council could then assess whether they wanted to uh, exercise or implement their policy around making land available for social housing or uh, just sell it at market depending on what offers come forward. But uh, it would, the main benefit is implementing the council policy in our backyard. So can we actually make an amendment to this uh, recommendation to remove abatement um, if um, we were wanting to get maximum value out of this property? Um, can we at, see who? At this stage, the recommendation is uh, not to go to market, uh, but to get, seek community feedback on this proposal. Right. Through you, Mayor, no, Joanne. Say, like, right, I mean, say thank you. <laughs> yep, yeah, uh, we've got Joanne McNeil. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Just to add to Anthony's um, uh, response, this report that's going up tonight is to test the idea of selling this land with the community and to get feedback. We would then come back to council uh, with the feedback from the community and also um, that would be the opportunity for us to then post that firm up the terms and conditions of sale. So this is not um, council's only opportunity to make a decision on how the transaction is uh, set up. This is more about whether or not the sale um, is considered um, by the community and uh, with the, within the context that's being proposed tonight. Thank you. Any other questions for the officers? If not, do I have a mover and seconder for the officer's recommendation or something different? Councillor Martin to move, do I have a seconder? I'm happy to second. Councillor Martin. Oh, Madam Mayor, I think it's an excellent idea to go to the community and see what the community wants us to do with this site. Once we've got the community's views and we come back to council, I have particular views on what I believe should happen, but this is not the time to do that. This is simply to go out and seek a community consultation on the process and we'll have a chance to deal with our own particular views and this further down the track. If we don't pass this motion, we won't get the process started. Um, and I'll speak to it. Look, I am interested in being a, a small section of land that doesn't provide a whole lot of value for the community as it is. I'd be interested to see whether other opportunities could be provided for this land. So I'm interested to hearing from the community, which we're all about is consulting with the community. So I'm happy to support this first step. Would any other councillor like to speak to the motion? No? Uh, councillor Martin, would you like to close? No need, Madam Mayor. Okay, let's put that to the vote. Councillor Baxter? Or. Councillor Bond? Or. Councillor Clark? Against. Councillor Crawford, four. Councillor Consolo. Four. Four? Four, yeah. Yep. Great. Uh, Councillor Martin. Four. Councillor Pearl. In favour. Councillor Sirikoff. Four. That motion is carried. Um, Councillor, uh, 
Item 13.4, which is the status of council decisions and questions taken on notice recorded from April the 1st, 2021 to 30th of June, 2021. Do we have any questions for the officers? Uh, Madam Mayor, could we just perhaps wait a couple of seconds to see if oh, we can get sorry. Councillor Copsey back? Yes, thank you. Um, and just to give a heads up, everyone, I'm thinking of after we quickly do uh, these next two formal reports and before we go into the notices of motion, which might require another uh, bit of debate, I might take five minutes just at the end of that before we go into the debate. Someone let me know because I can't see everyone when Councillor Copsey is uh, back. Or perhaps now is a good five minute break. Any of the tech people can tell me or she's, she's in. Back. Oh, you're back. Great. So, uh, Council Copsey, we're just asking if there are any questions for the officers on 13.4, which is the status of council decisions and questions taken on notice. No, uh, obviously we don't have any questions. Do I have a mover for the officer's recommendation or for something different? Do I have a mover and a seconder? Councillor Copsey to move, Councillor Baxter to second. Councillor Copsey, would you like to speak to the motion? No, thank you. Councillor Baxter. Yeah, I'll, I'll just note that this is actually a really good way for members of the community to keep track of the decisions that we make and, and where their implementation is at. I think that, you know, we're often briefed on things behind the scenes. We, we can often stay on top of things, um, but uh, we forget that, you know, out there in the community, they might go, well, what happened to that? that thing they said they were going to do. Um, although sometimes we also say, hey, what happened to that thing we said we were going to do? Um, so this can be very useful for that. So yeah, just want to point that out. People want to um, check up on us and they should. This is a good one to read. They should. Um, uh, would anyone else like to speak to the motion? No, rounding back to Councillor Coxey. No, let's put that to the vote, everyone. Councillor Bond. Four. Councillor Clark. Four. Councillor Copsey. Four. Councillor Crawford. Four. Councillor Consolo. Four. Councillor Martin. Four. Councillor Pearl. Five. Councillor Sirikoff. Four. Councillor Baxter. Four. The motion is carried. Uh, the final report for the night is 13.5, which is records of informal meetings of council. Do we have any questions to the officers in regards to this report? Uh, no, I'll question Councillor Bond. Um, question or comment, or probably just a bit of feedback. Some of them, these reports, the way they've been drafted, um, there's a choice between whether councillors were there in person or were there virtually. Um, some of the meetings have the meeting held virtually via Teams, and then the boxes have been ticked for councillors to be there to say that councillors were there in person. So there just may be just a, a little bit of correction to a couple of them, but I, I don't think that impacts too much on um, what they're trying to tell us. Thank you, Councillor Bond. Any other questions? Got a mover with Councillor Pearl. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Martin to second. Councillor Pearl. No, thank you, Madam Mayor. Councillor Martin. No, thanks. Anyone else would like to speak to the motion? Let's put that to the vote. Uh, Councillor Clark. Four. Councillor Copsey. Four. Councillor Crawford. Four. Councillor Consolo. Four. Councillor Martin. Four. Councillor Pearl. In favour. Councillor Sirikoff. Four. Councillor Baxter. Four. Councillor Bond. Four. The motion is carried. Now, councillors, I know it's all really tired and we've got a long way to go, but let's take five minutes to do a toilet break and come back and then we'll resume with the notices of motion, which is item 14 on the agenda. Because our meeting hasn't gone long enough yet. Uh, and so item 14.1 is a motion raised by Councillor Consolo on public toilet facilities. So do councillors have any questions of the officers in regard to this proposed notice of motion? 
Councillor Martin. Madam Mayor, um, is this the, the, the way that the proposal was written? We don't yet know the costs. If the costs were excessive, but we still want to do this, is there a way that this program could be staggered so we could do a certain number of toilets in the current financial year, budget for some more the following year, and so on? If we if if it was too big a financial impulse to do it all, all at the same time. Uh, Lachlan Johnson, would you like to respond to that? Uh, through you, Mayor. Uh, Councillor Martin, yes, we can. So um, we will look at, as the motion says, officers will look at providing, uh, seeing what's practical. Um, we obviously have, we have about 40 public toilets across the municipality. Some of those public toilets are more frequently used than other ones. Um, so there may be potential for staggering, but we'll have a look at what costs are involved in the logistics as well, with an aim to try and get something up and running by summer uh, and come back uh, to council. And um, we'll take on board the feedback that if um, uh, if the cost is significant, that we look at how it could be rolled out over multiple years. Question from Councillor Clark. Thanks, Madam Mayor. Um, could Council, I have, have a few questions. I'm happy to come back if there's others with some as well. Um, can Council officers advise why there's no soap containers currently installed? Lachlan? Uh, through you, Mayor. Um, uh, Councillor Clark, as it outlined in the notice of motion, there used to be soap and towel dispensers, uh, paper towel dispensers um, in public toilets. They were removed about six years ago in 2015 because we had high incidence of vandalism. And can I ask a couple of follow-ups, Mayor? Yes, yes. Um, so the motion refers to a long life battery stainless steel vandal um, um, container. Has a process been concluded to review what's available in the marketplace to determine that this is the soap container that we want to use? No, this is a motion of motion for councils. Um, through you, Mayor. Uh, we have, in preparing the notice of motion um, at Councillor Consola's request, uh, the building maintenance team um, have had a look uh, at some different things that are out there and had a chat with other councils uh, to see what is available. We haven't landed on a specific product yet. Um, you'll note in the notice of motion, we've put vandal proof um, in quotation marks because uh, mm -hmm. a lot of the soap containers are claimed to be vandal proof. Uh, but um, when we bring something back to council, we will, um, uh, we will uh, include some detail as to what would be proposed. I note as well that um, the soap dispensers that we're looking at this time around will probably be different to what was installed over in 2015. The technology has evolved uh, a bit, so we'd hopefully be able to find something that is potentially more resistant uh, to vandalism. And we're also uh, noting as well that um, the notice of motion refers to the reintroduction of soap um, only. It doesn't propose that the uh, hand towels are um, reinstituted the public toilets. And sorry, my my final question, thank you, was um, a month is a very short time frame, uh, and usually uh, in our discussions, the council officers often mention the sort of, they've got a lot of other commitments that they're working through and, and tasks to do. So I'm just wondering if it's realistic to um, be able to achieve this in a month, which would be the end of September, and then be rolling them out by December in two months' time. Lachlan? Through you, Mayor. Um, Councillor Clark, it's a, it's a good point. Um, look, the, uh, we included in the notice of motion there the supporting information that it would be within a month or so. Um, I would hope that the team would be able to bring something back in October um, to be able to roll out uh, something, installing the soap dispensers is something should, we should be able to do quite quickly um, if council does um, uh, resolve to have that as be the direction. So um, I'm confident that if we bring something back in October um, for council's uh, consideration, uh, depending on the scope, that we can implement it um, in December ready for, um, uh, ready for the busier summer period. Thank you. Any other questions, councillors? Um, I have a clarifying question for yes. uh, Councillor Consolo, if there's no further ones for officers. Uh, yes. 
Yeah, go for it. Uh, thank you. Uh, just seeking some clarification on the wording of that provide uh, a report to council on the costs and the timeline for reintroduction of the soap containers to before the commencement of summer. So my understanding of thinking of the motion was to get uh, an understanding of the costs and obviously the um, soap container needs to be finalised as to what, what one we would be choosing. Um, if it comes, I'm assuming that the focus of the motion was to bring this back to council so we could see the cost and understand that before and then vote on that. But the way the motion's worded, I'm just seeking clarification, it seems like it's going to be rolled out irrespective. Is it, is it to bring it back to council to have a vote on that? Council, uh, I think sorry. I understand you're saying that yeah, the report's going back so we can have further discussion, but I'm just introducing this so we can have that further discussion. It's just the way it's worded about reintroduction of them before the commencement of summer suggests, well, could suggest that it was moving ahead by summer um, as opposed to bringing the report back to council for further consideration. I think the intent, yeah, I think the intent is that it's not in financial year 22, 23, it's giving it some kind of parameter to work towards, but that report will tell us if that's even feasible. Hmm. Okay. All right, let's, any other questions for officers? All right, obviously we have uh, a mover, uh, which is Councillor Consolo, and we've got a seconder from Councillor Pearl. Councillor Consolo. Thank you. Many people try to avoid public toilets, but many cannot, especially with young children. Uh, it makes even more sense during a pandemic to have soap in our public toilet facilities to encourage good hygiene. This notice motion is requesting a report back from council officers to the councillors to make an informed decision. Since we don't know about costs and other um, parts, what product we'd be looking at, all of that. But I do hope it is in time for the 21-22 uh, summer period as that's when we get even more people in our area. I know that there were issues of vandalism to the paper towel dispensers and that the mess that it led to or why they decided to remove it in 2015. I've had feedback from the community that have, uh, having no paper towels would be fine for reasons for, for waste and all that. But in hand dryers, they don't necessarily want either for cost and energy use. So right now the priority is soap to have the ability to wash your hands properly. Councillor Pearl. No, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, would anyone else like? Oh, Councillor Martin. Now, I've been in the leadership team in five different schools over 30 years, and the biggest issue in all of those five schools has always been soap and toilets. And uh, I'm sure if we consult our people out there, it's going to be a huge issue for our local community as well. So thank you, Councillor Consola, for bringing this forward. And I'm glad it's the council making the decision and not just me this time. Councillor Baxter. Uh, thanks, Madam Mayor. Um, yeah, look, I'll just uh, I'll, I'll be supporting this. Obviously, um, uh, soap plays a, a really important role in containing the spread of uh, COVID as well as other communicable um, viruses. So uh, this seems to me like something we should definitely be looking at doing. Um, I just want to make a, a really clear um, to all of the councillors that calling for a report means you call for a report. The report comes back and then you decide what to do with it. And I feel like some councillors have um, sort of re really misunderstood what, what, what the purpose of some of these reports are. It doesn't say, I'm calling for a report into how how we might implement this by summer. It does not say we are implement this, implementing this by summer. It means we're calling for a report on how we would do that. Um, the CEO will come back uh, or, or the delegated officer will come back with a report saying, this is how much it would cost. If we were doing this by summer, this is where we would do it. This is how we would roll out. It's it's, it's really that that that's how it is. So, um, when you when you ask for information about something that does not commit you to doing that thing, um, I'd be supportive of us doing it. Obviously, depending um, you know what, what what the costs are and things like that. But I think that that's actually a really important thing for for councillors to note is that. We absolutely can seek this information uh, and should seek this information. And depending on what comes back, we can then decide what course of action to take. Um, cheers. 
Thank you, Councillor Baxter. Would anyone else like to speak to the motion? Councillor Consola, would you like to close? No? All right, let's put that to the vote. Councillor Copsey. Very much for. Councillor Crawford, for. Councillor Consolo. For. Councillor Martin. For. Councillor Pearl. In favour. Councillor Surikoff. For. Councillor Baxter. For. Councillor Bond. For. Councillor Clark. For. The motion is carried. Moving on to item 14.2, which is a motion raised by Councillor Baxter on further support for community members impacted by COVID-19 lockdowns which I guess is kind of appropriate as the lockdown gets extended. Okay. Uh, councils, do we have any questions of officers in regards to this report? I don't know what that means, but any questions? Oh, thank you. Uh, I think we've all lost the plot a little as we get later on tonight. Um, so no questions to the officers? All right, Councillor uh, Baxter, this is obviously your notice of um, motion. Uh, do we have a seconder? Councillor Martin, Councillor Baxter. Um, yeah, so uh, should I read out the uh, the motion? Yeah, uh, yes, it's not too long, is it? Yeah, oh, it's not too long, no. So I, Councillor Tim Baxter, give notice that I intend to move the motion outlined below at the Ordinary Council meeting of Council on 1st September 2021. Uh, that Council 1 notes that the current lockdown, which will have been in place for four weeks by 2nd of September 2021, may be extended beyond that date. Well, we found out that it will be. Um, two, note that our community has been disproportionately impacted by lockdowns, having a higher proportion of those who, through no fault of their own, have been stood down without pay and been unable to pay rent and other bills. Uh, three, notes that lockdowns play an important role in containing COVID through reduction of transmission. Uh, four, notes that uh, support for people during lockdown last year in the form of a state moratorium on evictions and income support through JobKeeper and JobSeeker played an important role in helping people stay home and contain the virus. Five, request the Mayor to urgently write to the Premier or a relevant Minister asking state government to reinstate the moratorium on evictions, rent relief for eligible tenants and suspension of rental increases as was in place last year. Six requests the Mayor to urgently write to the Federal Treasurer asking for the Commonwealth Government to reinstate income support payments to assist workers and job seekers impacted by the most recent lockdowns as was in place last year. Okay, and we have a second. Uh, oh, we do, Councillor Martin. Uh, Councillor Baxter. Uh, okay, so I think. Um, I think that the, the the motion makes it clear what what we're trying to do here. Basically, uh, there's sort of two things that that the motion seeks to do. One is is to advocate for our community that are struggling in terms of um, not being able to work, um, not being able to uh, earn money to to pay their bills, and not being able to um, you know through no fault of their own. It could be that the that the businesses are, have been closed due to COVID, or or, or there are other risks. Um, uh, they may have lost uh, employment or they may have simply lost shifts, um, uh, but, uh, but it's to advocate uh, for support for them. But uh, the, the other purpose of the motion is, is to actually get a more effective um, COVID uh, management strategy. Um, the main difference between last year where we were able to, um, you know, first sort of flatten the curve and then um, pursue elimination uh, of COVID in, in many states uh, was greatly assisted by the fact that people could stay home if they had a sniffle or, or, were, or were a little bit concerned about the fact that they'd been to an exposure site or something like that, um, safe in the knowledge that there would be some, uh, you know, payment um, that they were uh, able to be eligible for or that, um, you know, they wouldn't be evicted or that they would have rent relief. So. Um, that we don't have this year. And I think that that's one of the things, um, or it's been identified as one of the things, uh, as well as a more virulent strain, uh, that is driving uh, the continued transmission of COVID um, this year. People now have to make the decision of, if they went to an exposure site, um, should they still go to work? 
Because if they don't, they, they, they won't be able to pay their bills. So what do they do? Do they take the risk and, and, and go to work and, and potentially spread the virus, but they still get their money or do they stay home and forego that income? This advocacy is about trying to reinstate some of the systems we had in place last year that helped remove that difficult choice that people would have would have to make. Um, I uh, I note as well that there's there's no uh, while, while uh, number five is quite specific about some of the things that worked on a state level. Um, item six leaves it relatively open for the federal government to choose what what kind of income support um, payments uh, they can they can look at on top of um, what's already offered, which is quite limited in in in, in what they uh, can give out, um, but. Uh, it, it, it means that you know we don't have to necessarily reinstate JobKeeper exactly as it was, or or the increased JobSeeker exactly as it was. It can be a new system or whatever. But we need to make sure that we're advocating for our community, um, who there are so many hospital workers locally, there are so many arts workers locally who have just absolutely um, struggled, and um, this is this is about speaking up for them and making sure that. Uh, they're not either pushed out or forced into making risky choices. Councillor Martin. I don't wish to be critical of our state and federal governments. I think all three levels of the government have worked very hard over the last 18 months during the pandemic. But I do think that things perhaps aren't quite as clear at both state and federal level during the current they were 12 months ago and particularly as we've just learned today that we're looking at at least another three weeks of lockdown and potentially more um, the least the state government can do is to reinstate the moratorium that council back has referred to i note that our own council is putting in over two million dollars to look after the south melbourne market and our other council tenants and we'd hope that the state government is will be able to look at a moratorium on evictions rent relief and so on and we as a council, we need to look after our local rate payers and we need to urge the state government to do that. And I also note that the current ways of supporting people on low incomes isn't quite as effective as at supporting them as the job keeper system was last year. And if you do have a sniffle at the moment and you're concerned that you might lose money, you might go to work when you perhaps shouldn't. And given the current system, that's not necessarily a good thing. So again, we need to approach our federal government about that. So, Councillor Baxter, thank you so much for bringing this to our attention. And hopefully, Madam Mayor, you'll be able to write on both of these issues once the meeting's over. I hope you don't mean tonight. Sorry. Oh, yeah, tonight. <laughs> Time's of the essence, Madam Mayor. Um, Councillor Clark. Thanks, Madam Mayor. Um, I'm sure Council and Council officers are aware that um, that the federal government is offering COVID-19 uh, disaster payments. People who've lost more than 20 hours of work in the previous week can claim $750. Um, people who've lost eight hours or a full day's work to 20 hours can claim 450. And you can also claim money if you have to go and have a test. Um, it's the same level of support that was provided uh, last year with JobKeeper. And uh, it's really exciting that since July last year, or well, not exciting, but you know, helpful that over $450 million in COVID disaster payments has come to Victoria, so Victorians. So like this, I don't think should be supported um, so that we discourage more of them um, that are not relevant to focusing on the decision-making that improves the community through this tier of government. Uh, that we influence. Um, I'm happy to have been able to provide this information to council that um, and councillors that if we're if um, councillor Baxter was not aware of these payments, um, and it it seems somewhat a waste of council resources um, to be discussing this. But um, and so for that reason, I won't be supporting the motion. Would anyone else like to speak to the motion? Uh, Councillor Consolo. Thank you. I often hesitate about supporting matters outside of the, what I see Council's role is, but in this one, it is affecting our area and it's an advocacy just saying that we, our area represents many people who have roles like this. And it's, there's what I think what you're mentioning there, Councillor Clark, is that 
some of these are after people have lost their jobs. And I find that we have a big issue right now with people trying to keep their jobs. And so if the intent is to say, well, maybe if this was there, people would stay home and that would, um, whatever, change the curve. But, you know, there's so many different versions of everybody's life right now. Like what I struggle right now with is time. And no one can give me time because I have children to teach and look after. But I still have to deliver on my job. So we have to be really sensitive to the fact that there's so many reasons why people choose to do what they're doing. And it's not a blanket rule. So if this would help for some people who are more in a, a, a um, hospitality job or whatever, if they say that they can't keep their business going and if they can encourage these payments and that's going to help our area, uh, I think it's worth supporting because uh, Councillor Baxter is saying that this support is not what we have currently. Would anyone else like to speak to the motion? Councillor Copsey. Thank you. Just briefly to say thank you to Councillor Baxter for putting this motion on the agenda. Sadly, since it was added to the agenda, I think it has, uh, as of today, become even more timely um, advocacy for the Mayor to undertake. I have no doubt, um, given the changing situation in Victoria, that actually there will be probably some thinking uh, in this space now that we're looking at a longer term lockdown, or at least I certainly hope so. And so I think it's uh, very timely for the mayor to open up that dialogue and to make this um, make this advocacy request on behalf of our community. One thing that we're learning a lot through this pandemic is that inequality, you know, inequality is not just uh, an evil in and of itself um, because of the suffering that it brings around and and the lack of uh, the disparity of opportunity that it creates. But it actually makes things worse uh, when we're trying to deal with issues that affect us all as a society. There was a really interesting, there's been some really interesting study um, done through this time. And I saw a short piece of um, reporting the other week that looked at essentially um, inequality as a magnifier of risk for COVID-19 transmission and the researchers who were looking at that were taking as um, some of the indicators precarity of housing and precarity of income, or precarity of job security. Uh, some places in our area were, um, you know, okay on that front, but St Kilda was rated as very high uh, on both of those inequality measures. And unfortunately, you know, we have seen that it's impacted our community um, and that we have had challenges around here. So I think this is very timely to undertake. I think there's a really good case for us as a community to be making this advance because um, we know that lots of industries are affected here and also that there are some um, pockets of disparity in our community. You know, in the longer term, it underlines why we need to, more, to do more to address both of those issues. But I thank Councillor Baxter for putting this advocacy on the agenda. I think it's very timely and I'm very happy to support it tonight. Would anyone else like to speak to the motion? I just want to add two points that have not been um, that why I will be supporting this motion. Um, I think advocacy in a letter can do much. Uh, but the two things that are particularly interesting, 50% of our municipality rent. So if you're a lucky homeowner, I think it's, and although there may be mortgages, we have to remember that 50% of our, our um, our uh, municipality rent, and that also would apply to uh, traders and businesses as well. So, um, you know, looking for where we can um, shore up any certainty for them, so that they can remain homes or their businesses might be able to survive a little longer. I think that's not a, a not a big ask um, for us to write a letter and and ask for advocacy in that part. And the other thing that is missed is completely is the unfortunately the disaster payments um, do not apply for people on job seeker. And as we heard before with St Kilda Fest, the people that got missed mostly uh, under JobKeeper were casuals, which is the, basically the entire creative industry. So there are many, many people in our municipality that would not be eligible for those disaster payments. And the um, job seeker amount has not gone up. It's about $250 a week, or is that a fortnight? I can't quite remember, and I, I think it's a week. 
so not enough to kind of cover all their basic costs. So I think it's beyond just what the disaster payments is, is actually there are so many people who are not eligible for this current um, emergency uh, payment and, and, and when we should be advocating for them right now, I think there is still room to do more advocacy. So I'm very happy to write a, a letter uh, or support this motion to write a letter to the various levels of government urging for more support for our community. Would anyone else like to speak to the motion? Councillor Baxter. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, yeah, look, uh, there, there has been some, some data that's come out um, about, you know, inequality and, and uh, what the effects of, of, you know, the lockdowns and uh, and the virus has been on uh, people, particularly renters or people who are in precarious work and that sort of the stuff that Councillor um, Copsey um, mentioned. And obviously I want to reiterate that, you know, uh, the, the lockdowns have helped us um, you know, contain the virus, right? This is not an anti-lockdown thing. This is just recognising that with the lockdowns comes a lot of um, economic uh, problems for people. Um, so, you know, one, one of the reports that, that Tenants Victoria um, came out with identified our area as having some of the highest uh, renting stress um, in the state. Uh, and that wouldn't be surprising given how many renters uh, we have uh, and, and giving um, some of the economic uh, disparity we have in our uh, municipality. Um, just uh, responding to um, Councillor Clark's um, stuff. So uh, I note that Councillor Clark didn't, um, didn't seem to take any uh, issue with um, item five, talking about the, the state government uh, uh, things there. So I'm uh, hoping she's supportive of those. Um, with regards to uh, item six, the, the disaster payments that are available now are, are not even close to being um, anywhere near the income support of last year. They are not a replacement for them. Um, that's evidenced by the fact that not as much is being spent on them by uh, the federal government, uh, despite the fact that the two largest states are still in lockdown. Um, the eligibility requirements are really very strict um, to the point where, where, where many people uh, are unable uh, to apply for them. And it also, um, people have to go through the Centrelink system uh, to apply for them rather than having it be through their em employer, which um, made things a bit uh, easier in the past. So there are a lot more barriers to claiming any kind of money um, uh, this year um, and they're not necessarily barriers that are easily surmountable by people who are stressed out, losing work and just trying to get whatever hours um, they can. Um, I will also note that um, that uh, this this advocacy uh, has been picked up by many other peak bodies that advocate for um, uh, for social services and 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 uh, um, other uh, aspects of civil society. So this is not really something that is just Tim's opinion. This is there's a lot of actual data and research to back up why this year is different than last year in terms of government support. So I certainly. I don't subscribe to the notion that, that, that the feds are doing everything they can and nobody needs anything more. Everybody's fine because they're clearly not. Um, and so we need, to, we need to advocate more. Our community is hurting. They are doing it tough. Our renters are doing it tough. Uh, and even though council has done quite a lot uh, in this area, um, uh, particularly around food programs, um, there's only so much we can do. The feds need to step in and, and you only need to look at the example only a couple of weeks ago where a food bank um, uh, in Melbourne had to be shut down by the police because the incredibly long car queue for it was obstructing traffic and leading to hazards because so many people needed to access that food support. This is not uh, indicative of everybody's doing fine. The feds can give, you know, they can they can get their payments. The feds are doing enough. They're not and people aren't doing fine and they need our assistance. So that's um, why I brought this motion and I'm hoping that we have enough support to pass it. All right, well, let's put that to the vote. Um, Councillor Crawford, four. 
Councillor Consolo. Four. Councillor Martin. Four. Councillor Pearl. Against. Councillor Sirikoff. Sorry, I didn't hear what he said. What was that? Doesn't matter, Councillor Sirikoff. Against. Councillor Baxter. Four. Councillor Bond. Abstain. Councillor Clark. Uh, Councillor Copsey. Four. That motion is carried. Moving on to item 14.3 is uh, a motion that I have raised myself in relation to proposed state government planning reforms. Um, councillors, do you have any questions for the officers in regard to this proposed notice of motion? No? If there are no questions, um, I am obviously the mover of this notice of motion. If we could pop that on the screen and and um, I won't read through it because there are uh, quite a few, few uh, sentences to it, but do I have a second or I do, Councillor Martin? Thank you. Uh, Councillors, I bring to this to you tonight to uh, seek your endorsement of, of um, of supporting the idea that uh, no matter what the state planning reforms may be, that um, retaining the importance of community voices and council voices in any kind of reforms are essential. Um, there are some um, big projects uh, noted that may come, uh, significant state projects, which of course we are keen to see in our municipality, but of course, as part of any planning process, as we well know, it is a very uh, emotional and um, subject that engages many members of our community and they want to have their say, they want to have their opportunity to be heard, to object, support, whatever it may be. So this, this motion really um, is adding our voices to a, a group of uh, councils uh, across the city who are just wanting to, looking for the opportunity to reform some of the state government planning, um, which of course can be wieldy at times and looking for where there is po good possibility. But as part of that, working very closely with councils who are um, the uh, responsible authority in many, 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 I can't even know, I won't even give a number, um, planning matters and obviously the community that we um, are elected to speak for, as well as the community themselves. So this motion is really just bringing that all together to um, get your support so that we continue to work with the state government um, and, and get great planning outcomes for our community. Councillor Martin. Madam Mayor, we Gateway Ward councillors have just been through a situation where we've had an example of how these new planning reforms may cause some consternation in our community. There's a planned new um, social housing development in South Melbourne. A number of local residents have objected. Council officers were involved in producing a council opinion. The law changed in the middle of all this and the objectors feel in limbo. They don't feel that they've had a chance to be heard. Our council officers have put forward a recommendation. They're not sure whether they're gonna have their, their information heard. We need a system that even if the planning minister is gonna be the ultimate authority, that we need to make sure that our local residents are heard, that our council officers are heard, that there's an appropriate consultation process. And from what I've noted in this particular issue in the South Melbourne area in the last few weeks, what's currently been implemented is not working effectively. Your motion, Madam Mayor, hopefully will lead to some changes that will make sure that the local voices are heard. Would anyone else like to speak to the motion? Councillor Bond. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, you know, we're elected by the the residents and ratepayers of Port Phillip to represent them in all manners in matters including um, including planning, and they expect us to be there representing them in these matters. They expect us to to have a say. They expect us to to make decisions as we see fit to make them and sometimes that's right and sometimes that's wrong and sometimes they agree with us and sometimes they're not but they they expect to be able to witness that process take place and try and understand why it is we we do or don't vote a certain way in certain situations um i'm hearing a lot of disquiet in other councils from my conversations with councillors in other areas that they they they're not so so sure these planning changes are a good idea they um have concerns that have expressed concerns to me that 
there might be um, a lessening of the role in council and councillors in the um, planning scheme in our in our local municipalities. Um, so, and they would like to see us to maintain that role, not have that role taken away from us. Been a little bit of concern raised that some councils or some council staff have been asked to sign confidentiality agreements, whereby they they're not allowed to. Um, pass information or speak to or brief their councillors on certain projects, which is, which is also concerning. Um, so I think this is a you know it's a good notice of motion that we you know, as elected councillors elected to represent our area um, reiterate to the state government that that's our role, um, and especially in planning because it is one of the main issues that gets uh, residents and ratepayers um, backs up when when a planning. Um, application is lodged near them. I always say nothing brings a neighbourhood together like a planning application. Um, and it's been true for my entire nine years on, on council. Um, so they expect us to have this, this voice. They expect us to have a say in these matters. And I think any measure that, that winds back our role in this space is not good for um, local government. It's not good for the, for the local residents either. So I will be supporting this motion. Will anyone like to else like to speak to the motion? If not, I'll just quickly close. Um, I think living in and working in our municipality, we do know it best and we understand um, things on the ground uh, that perhaps other levels of government don't know so intimately. So I just think it, it is really important to ensure that whatever reforms come our way, uh, that our voices and our community's voices are central. So let's put that to the vote. Um, oh, no, it is this order. Sorry, Councillor Consolo. Aye. Councillor Martin. Aye. Councillor Pearl. In favour. Councillor Sirikoff. Aye. Councillor Baxter. Aye. Councillor Blond. Aye. Councillor Clark. Four. Councillor Copsey. Four. Councillor Crawford. Four. That motion is carried. Moving on. Uh, reports by councillor delegates, which is item number 15. Councillors, do we have any reports from delegates for tonight? No. Then we'll move on to items of urgent business. Uh, agenda item 16. Do we have any items of urgent business that I don't know about? And we don't. So 17 is confidential matters and councils we, uh, councils, we have no confidential items on tonight's agenda. So thank you for your patience uh, and being here tonight and there being no further business, I declare the meeting closed. <laughs>